I'd like to welcome you to the Tuesday, June 16th. The county commission meeting will be led this morning in the Pledge of Allegiance by Ken McFarland, whose last official meeting is today, correct? Yes. After 34 years of service. <laughs> Who's counting? It was 34 last week. <laughs> time, time flies. Okay. It's been a long two weeks. Come on. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, good morning again and welcome. Remind everyone to s silence their uh, cell phones, please. And uh, if there's a need for meeting documents, they're next to Commissioner Bender in that white binder and there's some outside the door the, with the agenda. Robert has, uh, where's Robert? We'll take care of it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, he has the availability of listening de devices. I'd also like to remind everybody if they're going to speak this morning, please use the microphone and you'll have to lean the mic into you. That's the best way that we can get uh, people to hear in the audience and frankly on uh, the rest of the service. Um, we'll go into routine business. I'd like a motion to consider the approved agenda. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any changes? If not, those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion unanimously carries. Uh, motion to approve the county commission minutes. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve county commission meetings of June 9th. Any changes or corrections? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. We have bills this morning that have been submitted for $363,856.27. Is there a motion? Pay the bills. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any questions, comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Reports, we have reports uh, that are available for your review of the County Regional Juvenile Detention Report for May 2015 and the General Fund Surplus Analysis as of March 31st. With that, we'll go to item five, Carrie Deaver. Uh, we have a considered a motion to approve the routine personnel actions. Is there a motion? I'll make that motion. We have a second. motion and a second. Any questions? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion unanimously passes. Uh, briefing on the 2015 Minnehaha County Affirmative Action Plan. Good morning, <coughs> Jen. Good morning, Commissioners. Jen Oddix from Human Resources. This morning, I'm going to provide you just a brief overview of the 2015 Affirmative Action Plan. As you know, the, the document itself is quite lengthy. And obviously, we have a full room this morning, so I'll keep it brief. Um, we have sent an electronic copy of the full plan to all commissioners for their review. And then additionally, at our March Diversity Committee meeting, we discussed it at length with all diversity committee members. And then at the department head meeting, we discussed it with department heads as well. Both department heads and diversity committee members have had the opportunity to review the entire plan additionally. We also have a paper copy of the full affirmative action plan available in the commission office, office should you wish to take a look at it. Minnehaha County has federal contracts with specific criteria that require us to prepare a written affirmative action plan. And we actually have to prepare two plans, one for females and minorities and one for protected veterans and individuals with disabilities. Jen, if I could just interrupt, uh, the people who are standing in the back, if you would like to sit over here, that's certainly available seating rather than standing, that would be great. I'm sorry about that. Ken. Just like church, you come late, you got to sit in front. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. Sorry about the sure, interruption. No um, 
The plans that we prepare take an in-depth look at the county's policies and programs as they relate to affirmative action. And we also perform a rather comprehensive data analysis that allows us to take a, a big picture look at county demographics as well as more carefully examine specific recruitment and hiring practices. And the comparison then gives us the opportunity to tr identify any kind of trends or data that might indicate a potential discriminatory impact in our employment practices. And then finally, our plans set our goals and our objectives to ensure our continued commitment to affirmative action. To analyze the statistics, what we do is we take all the different jobs at the county and we group them together by jobs that are similar in nature to what they do, level of responsibility, and then um, we compare the county workforce information against the job groups in the um, reasonable recruitment area, which is the Sioux Falls Metropolitan Statistical Area. And what we hope to see that is as a federal contractor, we're employing people in those groups at approximately the same rate as are available to us in our recruitment area. And the OFCCP, which is the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs, realizes that it's statistically unlikely we're going to have a one-to-one -one ratio. So they do allow us to um, analyze at an 80% level of representation. So that's what we're going to look at, although we always, of course, try to strive for that one-to-one -one ratio. The first chart that we would look at is um, an analysis of the minorities employed at the county compared to what's available to us in our reasonable recruitment area. The first column is the workforce availability. The second column is 80% of that, which is what the OFCCP has allowed us to compare against. The third column is where we were at last year. The fourth column then is where we're at this year, and it's all broken down by individual job group. And in this chart, we do miss a one-to-one -one ratio in three job categories, officials, skilled craft, and technicians. However, all of these job groups are relatively small, 31 or fewer people. And in each instance, if we were to employ only one minority in these job groups, we'd offset under any underutilization. Um, it is important to note, though, that there are no quotas with our affirmative action plan. Um, it's still always about hiring the most appropriate person and best qualified person for the position. So, of course, we're not penalized in any way if we're not meeting what the OFCCP indicates that we should be at. The next chart is structured exactly the same, and it takes a look at female employees at county compared with female availability in the workforce. There are three areas, again, where we miss that one-to-one -one ratio. Um, in one of those areas, skilled craft, if we were to hire only one female, that would offset any underutilization. The remaining two areas, service maintenance and technicians, we are more slightly underutilized. So we do, like I said before, a very comprehensive look at all of our recruitment processes throughout the year. Um, hiring termination practices have all been analyzed. We have not seen any sign of discriminatory impact. However, we're committed to affirmative action. We'll continue to address these issues each time we have the opportunity through our recruitment practice. The final affirmative action plan that we prepare analyzes protected veterans and individuals with disabilities. And this year we had to do a more comprehensive um, data analysis to meet the new OFCCP requirements. It did require us to go back, resurvey all of our workforce last year to update our information in these categories. And these last two charts are a little different in that there's a national benchmark that we compare against versus individual for each job group. For individuals with disabilities, the national benchmark is 7%. And you can see in each job group, we exceeded our goals. So we were very happy to find this out. We weren't sure where we would, um, where our employment levels would be because we hadn't collected this specific information in the past, but we were very happy to exceed our goals. The last chart then is the level of um, employment in each of those job groups for protected veterans. And for this particular area, we only have to analyze against workforce as a whole. We did break it down though just to be consistent with how we've done the other ones. And our um, national goal with this particular group is 7.2%. We identified 8.75% of our employees to be within that protected veteran group. So again, very happy that we exceeded our goals. That's really just a summary of all the data from the plan. Finally, our plan will go through very specifically outlining our goals and objectives for continuing affirmative action. All this information is, of course, provided in the full affirmative action plan, which you have the electronic version of, so I'm not going to go through all those points this morning. 
But we do set specific goals and objectives so that we know and are reminded that affirmative action isn't something we just address one time per year. We're looking at this throughout the year each time we have opportunities through our recruitment and hiring processes. This morning's just a review of the plan. I would ask that um, for formal approval of this plan next Tuesday, but I'm happy to answer any questions or concerns you might have today. Thank you, Jen. Does anyone have any questions? Just, uh, Commissioner Official. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. I, I just want, I know how much work goes into these reports and four slides. You did a great job of summarizing it, but it is a tremendous amount of work, and I really appreciate um, all the effort that um, you and your staff put into this. Um, it's, it's helpful to know that you meet goals. Sometimes the method that we have to go through to get to the results is, is questionable sometimes, but I really appreciate all your work. Thank you. Commissioner Kelly? Are officials just elected officials? No, actually elected officials are not part of the affirmative action plan. So, so officials are what, department heads? Correct, department heads and assistant department heads. Any other questions? Uh, obviously today is just a briefing, so next week we will adopt the information. So thank you again for your efforts and your time. Thank you. I just wanted to take a minute to thank the diversity committee as well for meeting with us <coughs> last month. We went through the um, plan in great, great detail, so I appreciate all their continued um, efforts and, and attention to this area. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Item 5C is to have a special commission action to approve a 10% temporary additional duty pay for Robert Wilson, the assistant commissioner, commission administrative officer, until a new commission administrator officer is appointed. Any comments, Carrie? Carrie Deaver from Human Resources. That summarizes, summarizes that the only thing I would add is this is very normal what you've done in the past when assistant department heads have stepped in for department heads during that vacancy. Mr. Chair, I make a motion to approve that. Okay. I'll second that motion. We have a motion and a second. Any other comments? Those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Uh, the second part of that is to have a special commission action to approve the temporary part-time appointment of Ken McFarland as a, until the new commission administrative officer is appointed. Any questions about that? Any? He's a valuable resource, and I'll make a motion to approve that. I'll second that. I have a motion and a second to approve that. If uh, I could. Can I just clarify the reason it's listed for you is because it is an exception to county policy and yep. a break in service issue. And I would say, too, that um, Ken has agreed to come back for a limited function, which is why Robert, of course, is receiving the 10% increase. As you most of us know, we're right in the middle of the budget season, and uh, that's an intense part of our timing and responsibilities, and to have the institutional knowledge that Ken has is extremely important for us until we try to acquire that in some other way. So um, thank you for doing that, Ken. Uh, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion unanimously passes. We're at item six, which is an application for abatement. I've been told that we can uh, take the first group by Kyle Helseth as one action, and then we'll do the second action uh, with Pam Nelson. So, Mr. Helseth. Good morning, commissioners. Kyle Helseth, director of equalization. We bring before you this morning 15 applications for a veteran's exemption. And with codified law being the way it is, I will just read the record ID number and the amount for the record. Record ID 29313, the amount of $1,452.46. Record ID 37236, in the amount of $657.47. Record ID 37737, in the amount of $244.94. Record ID 38549, in the amount of $369.56. Record ID 41726 in the amount of $790.69. Record ID 57531, in the amount of $906.71. Record ID 58892, in the amount of $1,233.30. Record ID 63985, in the amount of 
Record ID 64831 in the amount of $1,568.48. Record ID 67793 in the amount of $264.59. Record ID 73386 in the amount of $1,310.64. Record ID 76093 in the amount of $820.76. Record ID 78553 in the amount of $752.01. Record ID 82499 in the amount of $1,952.68. Last but not least, record ID 83567 in the amount of $339.48. Thank you, Kyle. Mr. Chairman, I wonder if Kyle could explain why uh, people get this exemption. That would be a good... This exemption is granted again by the Board of Equalization. It is based on uh, disability, veterans' disability, and it grants them up to $100,000 a year an exemption from property tax. These are all of the new ones for this year. And the old ones continue on as far as they don't need to reapply every year, is that they correct? These are all new. Correct. Make a motion to approve the ones listed. A second. Yeah. A motion and a second to approve the application uh, for abatements for items A through O. Any other questions? If not, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Thanks, Kyle. Thank you, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning, Pam. Nelson, County Treasurer. Um, I have record ID 28849 for the elderly assess or disabled assessment freeze. It's for um, $117.80. And then we have record ID 60493, and that is for um, $365.33. Thank you. Madam Chair, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, sorry. We're, our, our normal chair isn't here today, and she's a, a her. That's okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, I would ask the treasurer basically the same question. This is obviously an elderly uh, tax program, but they have to apply every year, right? This program is for the elderly or disabled. Um, they, because it's income-based, they do have to apply for it every year. And they have to have been a resident of South Dakota for at least two years. They have to live on the property for which they're requesting at least 200 days out of the year. Um, the single income guideline would be $26,353. And the uh, combined income household is $33,365. Um, Thank you, Pam. Thank you. These people are really... These people that we gave the abatements to today um, are 71 and 76, so they're keeping people in their homes. Make a motion to approve these uh, elderly tax okay. freeze. I'll second. We have a motion and a second to approve items P and Q for the elderly assessment freeze. Any other questions? If not, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion unanimously <clears throat> passes. Thank you. Uh, today, there's no notice and request issues. Uh, there's no planning and zoning notices for item eight. And item nine, there are no petitions for compromise that I'm aware of. <coughs> so we'll go into the opportunity for public comment. This is a time that if anyone has any comments that they'd like to make uh, that is on an item that is not on the agenda, that we're certainly welcome to hear those. Again, this would be a not on the agenda item. No one's moving, so we'll go to item 10. Um, uh, item 10 is to authorize the chairman to sign interlocal agreement between the city of Sioux Falls and the county pursuant to disparate allocation determination for the U.S. Department of Justice 2015 Burn Justice Assistant Grant. Krista. Good morning, Kristen Trano with the Minnehaha County Sheriff's Office. I bring to you what I feel is routine action. I bring this almost annually. Um, the Burn JAG uh, is a grant program that we participate in with the City of Sioux Falls Police Department. And um, in order for us to receive the funds from it, we need to enter into this MOU with the City of Sioux Falls stating that we'll receive 35% of the funds, the city will receive 65% of the funds, and they will be financially responsible for the grant as far as all of the reporting. Um, so for 2015, the overall grant award is $62,365. The county is going to receive 35% of this, um, which is $21,828, and the city will receive 65%, $40,537. 
um, but in order for this agreement to be completed, uh, the commission needs to um, approve it and allow and approve or authorize the excuse me authorize the chair to sign the agreement. Um, it has not yet been signed by the mayor. Once your action has been taken, it will be presented to the mayor. Of Super Thank Hills. you, Kristen. Any want to have any questions for Kristen? If not, is there a motion? I'll, I'll make, make a motion to approve. I'll second. A motion and a second to approve um, item number 10. Any other comments? If not, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Thank you. Thank you. Item number 11 is to consider the resolution to compromise various categories of county aid liens in accordance with county policy. Mr. Litz. Good morning, Commission Bob Litz from the Auditor's Office. Uh, talking about the annual lien cleanup, uh, your current policy is to cancel the following categories of county aid liens annually. First one is liens of more than $30,000 reduced to $30,000. This list has been reviewed by Human Services. Second category is liens on deceased persons reduced to zero. And uh, normal practice is to wait one year until we verify that the estate has no assets. And this list has been reviewed by Human Services. Third category is liens of no activity for 30 years reduced to zero. And the fourth category is liens under $250 with no activity for 10 years are reduced to zero. Uh, those are the four ones that I'm asking for action on today. There is a fifth category, and those are liens identified as uncollectible due to deceased, transient, SSI, homeless, or no resources reduced to zero. This category is not being compromised at this time because Human Services is still looking the list over. I request that you approve the attached resolution, which will cancel the liens that have been identified in the first four categories. Uh, let me know if there's any additional information, information that I could supply to you. Thank you, Bob. Any other questions for Mr. Litz? Mr. Chair. Mr. Barth. Um, Bob, how many liens over 30,000 are there that we're cutting back to 30,000? Is, no. is that a large number? Because I know we just had one this year that owed us uh, 20,000. Back in the day, we reduced him to 20,000, and he came uh, forward to try to pay some of that. For 2015, no activity for 30 years. Uh, the amount looks like $395,368.11. I'm sorry, but how about the ones over $30,000? Do you have a number on that? Oh, okay, yes, $30,000, okay. Uh, for 2015, it's uh, $2,107. Those have to obviously be pretty serious cases uh, medically or legally yes. before they get that big a bill. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Litz? If I might, uh, Bob, can you just remind us how much we have <coughs> uncollected liens at this point that we've had to book for various reasons and services we've had to provide? To the the total that the uh, the total of liens that have been placed since we started keeping track of this is one hundred and thirteen million three hundred twenty thousand four hundred twenty-two dollars and thirteen cents. Mm -hmm. Outstanding today. Uh, we have $47,221,809.95. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. So that's, that's the, yeah, that, those are, wait a minute, that is the amount that we have uh, uh, liens that have been paid or compromised, the $47 million. Okay, but the outstanding are $66 million? That's correct, Commissioner. Wait, wait a minute, what, you said the 66 number? Mm -hmm. That's what it says here at the bottom of the sheet. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, that's kind of a mistake because what they've done is take the they took the liens compromised or paid and deducted it from the total amount, so that's not an accurate figure. Uh, the the total the total amount, like I said, was thirteen million. Are you looking at for what's what's today? It says total amount of liens outstanding, and it says June of 15 is 66 million plus. That's what we have for uh, balance due, if you will, 66 million, I believe. If I'm looking at this right, and I don't have all the details. Okay, it is, yes, it is. It's 66 million 98,612 uh, $98, dollars. And this is an all-time high? 
but that that is the number there. Okay. This is the balance. It, it appears that this is the highest we've ever had. Lanes on uh, You know, it seems to me a few years ago we had it up in the 80 million, but we compromised some of that down. Now I could I could check on that. I'm not certain about that at this time because I don't have that information right in front of me. Is there a reason that? Uh, they're higher, uh, more activity, or more people not paying? Or, and, uh, uh, well, I, I think as time goes on and services to the county are provided to more people, that, that amount grows. And, of course, we compromise and we get some paid off, and the number fluctuates up and down, Commission. Are we being as aggressive as usual on collection? We're being as aggressive as we can, yes. We have, do have a collection agency called uh, Housing and Associates that uh, works with us. <coughs> a lot of people come in, they also pay on their liens. Uh, uh, but you know, as far as, uh, as, as far as, you know, the, our office or anybody going out after these people, we don't. They just sit and then a lot of times when they buy property, they'll come in because uh, it, it's found out uh, by the title company that they owe these liens. So. Um, are we aggressive bill collectors? I wouldn't categorize the or characterize the county as being that. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. You know, um, the auditor is right. Uh, we don't uh, necessarily dun people, but as people, uh, some people pay us regularly, and other people uh, come into an inheritance or a uh, lawsuit, and uh, we, we get that money. At the same time, uh, the cost of indigent uh, care in our county is is carried by the county and that includes uh, legal defense uh, uh, burials uh, medical bills uh, rent uh, electricity bills and uh, but we don't just give it to people you know if you get an attorney to represent you uh, we keep track of the bill on that and it is applied towards you forever and we do try to collect that and some people come forward and pay us twenty five dollars a month or five hundred dollars every other year uh, and some people then uh, come into a couple hundred thousand dollars and pay the whole twelve grand off at once but uh, uh, you know when you consider the fact that uh, thousands of people are going into our jail being charged with crime when you consider the fact that uh, the two hospitals between them bill us on an annual basis uh, something near th $30 million, which we settle for pennies on the dollar. If we paid that full $30 million, uh, uh, we'd have to raise taxes $28 million, I bet. Uh, and so we are very thrifty about this, and we do try to collect from people, but it's, uh, some people got nothing. Uh, other questions? Just a quick comment, not to drag it on, but public defender costs, public defense costs, uh, are probably about 40% of the $66 million. So, and that's the one that concerns me more than anything else is, is uh, and, the attorney costs. And supplied with your packet, there is a breakout of the, the description and the amounts for the liens. Uh, yes, $28 million for the, for the public defense. Of the 66. <clears throat> Big numbers, obviously. Uh, any other questions or comments? Did we have Looking a motion? For a motion? I'll make a motion to uh, make these compromises. We have a motion. Is there a second? Clean a second. We have a motion and a second to approve item number 11. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion unanimously passes. Thank you, Commission. I will uh, read item 12, but I, uh, obviously f most of you are here for items either 12 or 13 or maybe both. But um, we have a kind of a <coughs> system that we'd like to use, if you will. Uh, the planning and uh, board will introduce the uh, appeal, and uh, we will then ask... <coughs> We will then ask the applicant for uh, some comments in reference to uh, their application, the original application, and then we'll ask for proponents to follow up with any comments that they would like to make, and then we'll give the opponents time to make their comments, and then of course at the end we'll give the uh, proponent, if you will, uh, time for rebuttal. We'd like to keep this as open and uh, civil as possible, so we're asking those of you to limit your comments to five minutes. I'd like to know a little bit more about how many people plan to make a comment. If you 
if the proponents would raise their hand on somebody who would like to make a comment about the proponents on item 12, if you would show your hands, that'd be great. You need to raise them higher. I, we got one person, okay. Maybe two. Uh, the opponents on item 12, would you raise your hand if you're going to make a comment? Okay, so we have one for sure. Um, again, we'd like to limit the comments to five minutes approximately. If somebody has some additional comments during the discussion that they think about or they would like to make comments uh, about, we certainly want to hear those unless it's a duplication of someone else's comments, which uh, really may not have any value in the whole process, but we want to give everybody the opportunity to speak if they wish, uh, and then we'll do the same process for item 13. With that, uh, I'll read item 12, is to consider an appeal of a decision by the Minnehaha County Planning Commission to approve conditional use permit 15-29 to allow a Class C CAFO for 499 animal units on property legally described as Track 2, and I won't read the description, located approximately three miles north of Brandon and one half mile west of South Dakota Highway 11. Mr. Hookman uh, from the Planning Department, if you would uh, make your presentation. Uh, Kevin Hookman, County Planning Department. Uh, this conditional use, as uh, was just noted, is located is for a CAFO of 499 animal units, and it's located approximately three miles north of the uh, Corson Brandon exit and a half a mile to the west of the Highway 11. Uh, the CAFO is located near uh, the West Pipestone Creek, which flows into Split Rock Creek. Kevin, uh, would you do me a favor and move the microphone in a little right. bit? Thank you. Sure. Um, it's, the CAFO is located near the West Pipestone Creek, which flows into uh, Split Rock Creek, but it is not located within the floodplain and it is not located within a watershed protection area. Um, the 499 animal units that are requested is well under the threshold for any state required permit. Uh, however, the petitioner is uh, looking to obtain a certificate of compliance with the DENR, which is uh, more or less a the application for a state permit, but it is not binding on the applicant, um, but it will be showing that he is in conditions with the state um, requirements. Uh, the petitioner uh, has submitted geotechnical boring since he is close to the, the watershed protection area. And the geotechnical boring test does show that there is uh, plenty of lean clay uh, is what it's described and that the water, saturated water was 39 feet below uh, ground of the location of the facility. Um, other things, the uh, petitioner has submitted uh, documents such as nutrient management plan, which shows that he has enough farmland to apply all the nutrients and the, the waste manure uh, to, be, to meet the nutrient needs of the, the cropland he has. Uh, he has submitted recently, since the last meeting, a uh, new site plan. I'll kind of go over that in a little bit. Um, but uh, the location of the property, uh, this is the general location that the setbacks were required uh, for the property. Uh, and you can see there's two dwellings within that uh, light blue colored line uh, for the dwellings slash business slash schools uh, setback buffer area of 1,100 feet. Um, this would be a revised uh, site plan, and I have some more site plans too. Is this brings... on the uh, on no. our deal? Uh, this should be on this, on yours. 
You got to go down a ways okay. there. Okay, okay, it's way down, yeah, see it. Uh, this is a revised site plan that brings the, the proposed CAFO a little bit further to the south of the original uh, site plan that was received for the uh, Planning Commission meeting. And that was an attempt to move the CAFO uh, south of the existing tree grove uh, and further from uh, the, the neighbors that are in question, that are appealing this particular CAFO. Uh, and I'll go over some more site plans here too, which was just received recently. Um, So this site plan was received on uh, yesterday along with some other materials um, based on uh, some recent kind of uh, ideas and, and thoughts about the, the CAFO and trying to comply with everything. Um, as you can see, the CAFO location just south of the trees uh, moves this very far away from the neighbors to the north, but it does move it within closer proximity of the, like specifically the neighbor to the southwest uh, of the property. Right here. Um, the location there, if you bring it down to the specific site, the buffer area of 1,100 feet, uh, you can see that the house to the southeast uh, is well over that 1,100 feet. There's about 200 feet distance um, from the, the proposed CAFO to this house. Uh, so the moving it south brings it closer to these, but it's still pretty close to the buffer area. Um, and the petitioner has noted that since uh, we've last met, uh, he is not going to be able to obtain the uh, required waivers, um, which will become a, an issue on the uh, final, uh, the final um, condition that was placed on the uh, conditional use permit that was a, a that was approved at the Planning Commission. Um, he has submitted a, a landscape plan and a uh, shelter belt plan. There would be a shelter belt plan and he would be uh, using the conservation district guidelines to plant the shelter belt line. The grading will be, remain unchanged uh, and it'll generally flow to the east um, kind of in those general directions and you can see the um, the contours on that as well and on this he also has included the manure this containment structure that will be enclosed and attached to the building um, here's some pictures of the site oh I'll just go over a few pictures of the site here. This is the driveway leading up to the uh, tree grove, the existing one, uh, approximately where the uh, CAFO would be located here. <coughs> and he's already doing agricultural type operations at this site. Uh, this is looking to the northwest and you can see some houses in the background, farmsteads. Uh, this is looking down to the creek. You'll see that it's mostly pasture land um, and there's lots of kind of buffer area between the CAFO and the uh, buffer grass buffer strips for drainage. Uh, this is looking to the southeast at the farmstead that is about 1,300 feet away from the proposed CAFO. And this would be to the southwest at the closer farmstead that has an existing CAFO there as well. Um, and this is looking on the dry, uh, down the road towards the east where that um, uh, one of the hat dwellings is located. So, um, so 
So at the planning commission meeting, the, uh, the, pr the proposed CAFO was approved with conditions uh, from unanimous vote. They did add one condition and I will read all of them now. Uh, the facility shall be limited to 499 animal units in size. Copies of the nutrient management plan shall be approved and filed with the Minnehaha County Planning Department on an annual basis. Shelter belt trees shall be planted as proposed on site plan. In addition to shelter belt trees shall be placed in an approved location around the manure containment facility. Any dead trees shall be replaced within one season. The shelter belt trees shall be planted utilizing a minimum of Minnehaha County Conservation District standards. An address sign must be purchased at the planning department and placed in the driveway of the facility. The manure storage facility must be in conformance with South Dakota Department of Environment and Natural Resources design standards for any newly constructed waste containment facility. Registered professional engineer shall certify the plan specifications and construction of the facility. The facility shall conform to the submitted site plans. Any minor changes may be approved by the staff in Minneapolis County Planning Department. Major changes will require an amendment to this permit in a public hearing. A rendering, rendering service must be used to pick up removed dead animals from the property. The operation shall maintain fly control and not to become a nuisance for neighbors. A public a building permit is required for all structures prior to construction. The Planning and Zoning Department reserves the right to enter and inspect the dairy CAFO, the dairy calf CAFO at any time after proper notice to the owner to ensure the proper property is in full compliance with the conditional use permit conditions of approval and Minnehaha County Planning and Zoning Ordinance. And 12, the required waivers of the property owners to the two dwelling units to the south shall be attained prior to the issues of a building permit. And uh, that last condition of the waivers uh, will has become an issue according to the uh, the petitioner. So, if you were to approve this, that would pro have to be addressed. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, does anyone have any questions of Kevin right now, or we'll uh, come back to him after we hear from the applicant or their representative? Thank you again. Um, is the applicant or their representative here? Uh, if you state your name and address, please, that'd be great. Wyatt, Wyatt Sunwold, 1600 East Cedar Street, Brandon, South Dakota. Thank you, Wyatt. Uh, microphone's yours. Um, as Kevin was stating, uh, location is the planning site for a 499 animal unit CAFO, mainly designed to raise Holstein bottled bull calves and bring them up to 300 pounds, two to 300 pounds uh, before marketing them. Um, currently, the building that I've been looking at is all concrete floors with concrete walls that go up about four feet um, with curtains on the sides and then steel roof. Everything will be enclosed, uh, including the manure storage facility. Um, <coughs> And then uh, as the pictures show on there that Kevin had the manure um, storage facility will be located just north of the CAFO connected to it. Um, as I said, all enclosed and water entrapment will be done there as well. Um, and there is enough uh, buffer strip going to the east towards the creek of grass that is currently all established as pasture for any runoff to catch, plus also going to the southeast that's currently cropland. Any questions that you guys would have to ask or does anyone have any questions of Wyatt currently? Well, I'm, Mr. I'm, Bender? I'm curious about the waiver issue. I mean, yeah, and I was gonna touch on that next. Okay. Um after looking at it, um the dwelling to the southeast there is out of the measurement for their setbacks of eleven hundred feet. So I was asking for that to be revised or thrown out since it's already out of the distance requirements. And then also, um, since moving the CAFO back to the south to uh, leave a little bit of current shelter belt established for the neighbors to the north until 
the new shelter belt gets up and going really well. Um, the dwelling that is to the southwest, just as you can see from measurements, falls you know anywhere on average 40 to 60 feet of shore of that 1,100 foot setback. And also um, that family there farms and they're cattle men and women and have a CAFO themselves in their yard or house yard there. Um, and so with those stipulations I ask, and also the current management practices there and uh, manure management with uh, manure treatment and fly treatment to uh, have those setbacks be adjusted for that accordingly. Uh, thanks, Wyatt. Any other questions for him right now? Any other questions? No? Thank you. We'll mm -hmm. probably get back to you in a few minutes. Um, are there any other proponents of the application who would like to speak? Any proponents? Are there any opponents who would like to speak? Sir, if you'd give us your name and address, that would be great. And again, just remind everybody to move the microphone as close as possible. Morning. <clears throat> I'm Jeff Sorensen. Um, I live at 48186 257th Street. I have a handout for you. I talked to Robert yesterday, and he suggested one for each commissioner, but also some others. Um, Pass one of those away. Here's a two extras. You know, if you would take these up to them, that'd be great. Thanks again. So I wrote this out so I kind of stay to it. Um, I, I want to turn you to the second page. Um, and I, I went in and talked with uh, Mr. Hochman, and we took a, a map to this. Um, Ken, excuse me just for a second. Can we put that so everyone can see it in the audience? Oh. Yep. Are you able to do that? You are. Thank you. Wow. So, <laughs> all right. There are homes um, immediately to the north of the proposed site. Um, and in the staff report that Mr. Hochman prepared, it reads, there are a few single family dwellings and acreages a little farther out in the surrounding area, especially to the north along 258th Street. Um, and says that there's a low density of housing in the area. But in fact, and you'll see five of them here, but there are eight homes in the half section that's immediately to the north of the site. And five of them that are noted here are right along, not 258th, but 257th Street, which is right to the next, to the north. And uh, those five homes are, and you see the distance, 1644 to 2887 from the proposed site. Um, that's from the site that was brought to the Planning Commission of being um, where those trees are. And as four of those homeowners along uh, 257th Street then that have brought the appeal. The second thing to say is um, part of what makes this unworkable is that um, the proposed site doesn't lie in the middle of a section. Uh, but rather what you see here um, is that it's a half section and uh, there are township roads to the north and to the south of this and that there are homes um, and developments along both of those roads along the half section line. So north and south, it's not possible to be like out in the middle of a section where you're at a further distance, um, but this particular half section um, is designed differently in that way. Um, thirdly, the, and you're going to hear today uh, about the CAFO for Lacey's, but it was interesting at the Planning Commission meeting um, that there's an engineer that said um, at 2,800 feet from the site of a CAFO, the odor that is carried by prevailing winds would no longer be appreciably detected. Um, and if that's true, and that seems reasonable, 
but three of the homes um, along 257th Street are less than that um, the, because of the location and, and, and the closeness and are straight in line for the summer south winds that would carry the odor like, directly to us. Um, I want to go back to, if you would, then maybe the photos that are there um, that I've enclosed as well. Um, I don't know if you're able to... note in the photos, oh, I'm sorry, it's just the next one. The photos that the staff prepared were like shot from the roads and 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 really at a way that it's hard hard to see. Um, but if you, this, the, I took these shots yesterday and um, this is from the road to the north, but it is zoomed in in a way that you're able to see what's closer to actually being there. Um, the trees to the right there are the, the edge of that grove, um, and you see really how close those buildings are. Um, they're just like right there. Um, the next one is if you go to the, to the east of it and go to the east side of those trees, and, and, and as if you're standing closer to where this site is. And I didn't go on the site, that'd be trespassing, but I took from the road and then zoomed it in. There's the place that's directly to the north, um, the one that's the closest. If you take the next ones, um, this is from the, from the north side, and you see, this is my place, and you see it's from standing at my mailbox and looking to the southwest, and the large grove of trees there is, uh, it, it's more than a quarter mile, but less than a half mile across the field to that. And then the final one is um, from another neighbor's. This is Troy's place from his mailbox, and um, right there where you would see it uh, from the north side, about a quarter mile away. Um, number four, um, the stated plans, and, and he has acknowledged this, to expand to a 999 animal unit CAFO, um, would require waivers from the three property owners whose homes are less um, than the required distance to the north of the site. Now, I, that might be in question if he's moving it further south, and I'm guessing that's probably why he's moving it further south, to try to get out of that range. Um, but all those neighbors have said they will not sign waivers. Um, if he expands and it gets into the distance that's required, those waivers will not be forthcoming um, for that. Um, the number five, um, I noted that uh, the, the CAFO of Lacey's will have uh, covered manure storage. Um, now, um, Wyatt has said that, that his plan would include that. It was not there before. Um, he says he's going to plant, number six, a replanted shelter belt of trees. Um, and already there's this large grove of trees there. They're mature. It's where the original homestead was on this uh, property. And, uh, and, and he has said to um, planning staff that his intention is to raise that and replace it with a large building and shelter belt trees. Now we're hearing, at least today, that maybe not all of that would be raised uh, or not immediately. Um, that's a concern for us. Um, I mean, it's already there to screen it. And it's already there uh, to help and um, no reason to take it down. And then finally, um, he says that he intends to build a facility to house and feed baby bottle calves. But in fact, the, the conditions don't say that. that they do not stipulate that they be small calves and that does not stipulate that they be confined in a building. He says he intends that, but what he has going forward or a successor to him is what's actually in the conditions. And uh, if it's approved, it would allow this 499 full-grown feeder cattle uh, and more if he expands to 999, and they could be outdoors if it's uh, approved as a change by staff of the county to planning department because it's not in the conditions uh, uh, that that would that would limit him. So um, I guess that's uh, all that I would have to say, um, except this. Um, I, I want to say just a word to your process, our process. And that is, um, I think a lot of improvement could be made to the process so that this doesn't become so adversary 
neighbor against neighbor. Um, but that things could be done and could be led by you or planning commission with some change. So that it begins with neighbors talking to neighbors. Um, regardless of what the outcome of this is, we have a lot of repair work to do among neighbors. Um, we have a whole neighborhood that's been doing more talking together than we ever have before. But it's been about what? And um, a young man moving into the neighborhood that wants to get started, and uh, this is not the way to start. And I, and I think the process um, of us not knowing what's happening in advance, not seeing reports, finding things out when it's approved, um, just hasn't been helpful. And I'd be glad to talk further with you about process that, that could be more helpful. Thank you, Mr. Sorensen. Um, any other comments from opponents? Other comments from opponents? If not, uh, Wyatt or anyone else that's uh, part of the petition, would you like to do any rebuttal or additional comments? Why it's on hold. And I'd just like to uh, touch on a few things here, uh, mainly that Jeff had, and I uh, appreciate him coming forward and stating his opinion. Um, on the number one there, it shows that all those houses to the north there are over the 1,100 foot mark by a couple hundred feet. Um, on number two, uh, being that the cave would be lying in the middle of the section and the access road is on a half mile road, there's really including my dwelling that'll be there three dwellings on that road so there's not a lot of traffic and it's close to highway 11 so it's perfect for marketing cattle when the time does come and there won't be a lot of traffic for other people to have to worry about um and then uh, number four um you know everyone can dream i guess i don't have plans at all to expand that big that takes a lot of work to go to 999 animal units the reason for getting state certified or having that certificate of compliance is to just show my goodwill towards my neighbors because the state goes in fine detail then and makes sure everything all the i's are dotted t's are crossed and that everyone downwind from it upwind or all sides of every party is going to be protected from a kfo um, and on the trees there those trees that are showing where the building is uh, to be placed is uh, just a grove of volunteer trees that after this last ice storm two years ago really took a mangling and so it's time to be replaced eventually and uh, after hearing uh, neighbors concerns I'm more than willing to leave half or so of the grove there and eventually over time replace them once the other grove is well established. Um, Any questions in from you guys? Um, Commissioner Kelly? If if you were to, uh, once you're granted the 499, it would take a public hearing to to increase that? Yes, uh, for the count, on the county level, you'd have to go through and rezone it. Correct. And are the, are the distance requirements for, uh, say, a thousand head more than for uh, 499 head they are i don't know the exact numbers but it's for so many head you got to add another x amount of feet and it, i think it's right around 2,000 feet for a thousand so you'd long. probably be prohibited from doing that just virtually. right without signatures exactly okay. and all that so thank you yep other questions commissioner bender um why i'm i'm just kind of hung up with the waiver issue mm -hmm. and um because we have a process and we have to be able to uphold our process and show that we followed our own rules. And so um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I want to try to restate what I understood you to stay, say is that um, you understood that a wa waiver is required. You aren't able to get the waiver. And so you're asking um, that our requirements is that if you aren't going to get the waiver, you have to present new technology, management practices to topographic features, soil mm -hmm. conditions, or other factors which, which would substantiate a reduction mm -hmm. in that minimum separation requirement. And so what I heard you say was that the 
the factor that you wanted us to look at was that the neighbor that won't sign a waiver already has a CAFO. Is that correct? Or were there other factors you were asking us to look at? Yeah, sorry about not clarifying that any further. Um, that is one factor there, yes, as uh, well. Uh, they already do have a CAFO there. Um, I guess the other factors would be it's 40 to 60 feet on average, just if you measure it off the Minneapolis County GIS website, average of where from where the CAFO would be to their dwelling, the two nearest points. So it's, like I said, 60 feet average, pretty 40 to 60 feet average of just being shy of that 1,100 feet. Um, and that was one consideration I'd hope you take in. in. And then um, the technologies would be, um, they're to the south. So, well, I shouldn't say that's technology, it's more weather related, but they're to the south. So mainly the only time they'd be getting uh, breeze blowing towards them would be in the wintertime. And that's when they have their most cattle at their own yard too as well. Um, and then technologies would be proper manure management that would be implemented, um, the bacteria on the manure to help prevent odors, and then uh, just proper maintenance of the facility with cleaning out pens as needed and applying manure on timely matters. Mr. Chair. Mr. Barth. Um, how big a CAFO does your neighbor to the southwest have? Um, an exact number, I could not um, give you an exact number. I'm guessing it's right around 250 head. He raises um, stock cows and then has the calves off of them in the fall that he feeds out in the feedlot for a time being. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Any other questions for Wyatt? Any other questions for uh, Mr. Sorensen? Mr. Chairman? Yes. I would like to ask uh, Mr. Sorensen a couple questions. Certainly. Thank First you, of all, let me say I appreciate your comments about uh, communication mm -hmm. and stuff. And, you know, I, our process, imperfect as it may be, actually is intended so that we can discuss things. And some counties don't even go through all of this. They just bring the bulldozers in and start going. But, uh, you know, what could be done to make this uh, project more palatable to you? Is there something that the applicant could do which would, uh, you know, is there some configuration? Is there some, uh, you know, what could be done that would make it better? Are you asking that of process or? Well, no, actually of, of his project. Uh, is there, you know, should he plant flowers or, I mean, what, what do you got? Anything? <laughs> <laughs> I, I I don't know what might be, and I, so I'm just really it's a broad question. I, I apologize, but it, well, and I and I think I'm I'm speaking for neighbors, and I don't know Gary if you want to speak to this too, I, um, or others that are here. Um, we got together and um, and we said there might be some things that would be helpful if it has to happen. Those are different things, okay. And, uh, and one would be moving it south. One would be leaving the trees. Um, and so that um, it would be a better screen. Um, another would be his, his plan that he has suggested of enclosing the manure so that it's not uh, an open, uh, open. So those things would be helpful. Um, and, and of course, most, most helpful would be if he didn't do it. <laughs> Um, in terms of process, um, without pointing fingers too much, um, the letter that we got from Wyatt was like a week before and um, not entirely consistent with the report from staff that we didn't see until the meeting. And so the kinds of things that we heard presented at the Planning Commission. Um, some of that was entirely new, no chance to respond to. Um, and then wondering why is there the inconsistency here? And the, and the, and the, the big inconsistency is, and, and he says today, I don't plan to expand, yet the report says he does. Planning staff has said he does. Um, where is that? Um, and so having a chance to talk ahead of time that is in an informal way to really know where you're at, and as well as to see the report well in advance um, as a part of that conversation would have been very helpful for process. So. Those are good points. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Any other 
individual like to make any comments, we would certainly accept those comments before we move ahead with the decision-making issues. I have more questions. Um, Ma'am, you need to come to the microphone, please. Um, so I'm Kim Barber for 8146 257th Street. And like I said, this is more of a question than a comment. When he, when Wyatt did his original plan, he um, planned for bottle-fed calves. But bottle-fed calves are way different and produce a lot more manure than th a 300-pound cow. And so today what I'm understanding is that this is approved for five or 499, 300-pound cows. Is that true? Mr. Chairman, I believe uh, planning can answer that, but an uh, animal unit, uh, um, a dairy cow is like 1.4 uh, animal units, a calf is one animal unit. Uh, is there a weight, uh, Kevin, that here comes staff to give me a better answer here? Yes. Um, as you noted, the, the calves are going to be worth one animal unit, uh, and we have no distinction between a calf or a full-grown cow. Um, only uh, So you can have a 1,000-pound cow. cow, and it's one animal unit, or a 200-pound calf, and it's one animal unit, uh, unless it's a dairy a cow, and then that goes up to 1.4 animal units. So who makes the determination of when it's, you know, if he's got 499... <coughs> I mean, at what point does he have to wean those down to stay within those guidelines of 1 to 1 1.4? If, if, so he can have up to 499 animals, uh, whether they're calves or whether they're 1,000-pound uh, cows, um, and, but they're considered a cow once they are milked and whatnot. Um, so he's not going to be milking there, so that's not going to be a 1.4 animal unit as a dairy cow. Um, if there is uh, concern that he has more animals than allowed, staff can go out there and check his property at any time as listed in the conditions. Thank you. That answers my question. Any other questions? Any questions from the commission? Mr. Chairman, uh, you know, uh, it is important that neighbors speak to each other, and it is better when we have more communication. But at this point, I'll make a motion to approve uh, uh, item number 15-29. Uh, you're talking about permit 15-29? Yes, sir. Okay. Any I'll second comments? that. I'll second that so we can talk about it. Okay, we have a motion and a second to accept uh, conditional use permit number 1529. Can I make a comment about uh, condition number 12? Absolutely. And uh, if he is unable to obtain those, um, those waivers, he, the condition approval, conditional use permit pr approval will not... Uh, be very useful because he won't be able to build the building according to item number 12 or condition number 12 so you'll have to address condition number 12 oh, correct i have a question on that um does he meet all the legal criteria i uh, we he has since submitted uh, any holes that uh, have been missing such as the grading plan and the landscape plan uh, that weren't presented in the last um, uh, uh, meeting mm -hmm. uh, he has submitted those materials uh, and he does i have up here showing um, this is his uh, documentation of what he plans to do or the, what, what his reasons are for reducing his setback so, so that would be the it, and it's your choice whether that those reasons are substantial enough to um, reduce that setback. So the 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 law or whatever is that if he's unable to maintain or if he's unable to attain, to obtain waivers, it actually becomes an automatic appeal, does it not? I mean, it was approved. Well, the appeal, the approved. The, Planning Commission action has been appealed, but going into the planning, if he met everything and he couldn't receive the downstream or whatever waivers, then 
that doesn't stop the project totally, does it? I mean, can one neighbor block the whole thing? Uh, yes, if it's not approved with the, the waivers. Uh, as this is stated in the conditions, um, that the, the two waivers are required for the building permit um, because they just, the Planning Commission decided that the waivers, uh, there wasn't, were obtainable one because at the time, uh, uh, Wyatt thought that it was going to be easily obtainable for those uh, permits or those waivers. Uh, and then two, uh, that there, at that time there just wasn't quite enough information to substantiate the reduction in setback. Okay, so so what's causing this is the fact that you added number 12. Yes, at this point, yes. Uh, if I might ask a question uh, our of our state's attorney. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that we uh, have all the legal yeah. issues if, addressed. If I can add this, and this goes back to what Commissioner Bender was pointing out in the in the criteria. I mean, your your additional use regulations basically state that the waiver is required out to that. What is the distance? Uh, this would be 1,100 feet. Okay. So if it's within that, that is in your ordinance. Whether that's a condition or not in the permit, that still applies, in my opinion. Now, the one that's outside, 1,300, some to the southeast, that was an additional condition that legally you could remove, and that wouldn't offend the... The, the regulation, if you will. I think where what Commissioner Bender was probably alluding to here is the, absent, the option of not having the signed waiver uh, depends on a finding by you that there's new technology, management practices, top topographic features, soil conditions, or other factors which substantiate the reduction in the minimum separation criteria. And that must be presented through documentation according to your, according to your regulation. Now, whether that satisfies that second prong, I think, is really the, the question that is before you to decide whether that was sufficient. Thank you. Well, so, can I follow up on that? Um, the 1,178 feet is outside the... Is it this one here we're talking about, I assume, well, isn't it? And, and I believe that's an old measurement because I believe the site's been tweaked since then from what Mr. Sorensen's documentation shows now. It is actually closer to that home that's to the southwest now right. and yeah. is within 1,100 feet. Oh. I think everybody I, agrees yes. on that, correct? Uh, in an effort to... Uh, help with the appeal, the appealers of the property owners to the north. Um, he, White has moved the facility to the south, um, and that has brought them in within the the 1,100 feet. So. so we're talking about 31 feet? Yes. Any other questions? Has there been any meetings of, of all parties with us? No. Other questions? Other comments? Mr. I have a substitute motion, and I hate to do this. Um, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what the vote's going to be. But uh, I am concerned that the project goes ahead and everybody's mad or the project dies, and, and yet uh, maybe with some conversation, it could still, if, if we turn it down, then it kind of starts over, right? And, uh, if you turn it down, he cannot apply for the same project for six So we months. go through the whole thing yep. again. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to move to defer this for two weeks and see if the parties can get together. I would suggest that they have to sit down together at a kitchen table or something and, and see if there's any resolution to it. And then... Uh, if not, come back to us in two weeks, and we'll have to make the decision. That's my motion. Is there a second to Commissioner Kelly's motion? Mr. Chairman, we actually have a motion on, so this would be a substitute? Yes. Yeah, substitute. Okay. I will second that motion. Okay. We have a second. Let this be deferred for two weeks. That's a substitute motion. 
Any other comments from anyone in the audience or anyone? Mr. Chairman. Yes. I, I guess I oppose the substitute am amendment. I, is there no way, and I guess I would ask the applicant, that we can solve this 31-foot uh, problem here? Uh, if I might ask him that question. Sure. Go ahead. Wyatt, uh, can you move this project 31 feet to the east or something like that and solve this issue? That was going to be my next thing that I, if I could come up and ask, yeah. I can move it north 31 feet, south or east, northeast. So on that basis, then we would uh, solve the the technical issue of the 1,100 feet. And uh, I guess I'm sort of surprised that anybody with an existing uh, CAFO operation would object or not allow their neighbor to have and the same <coughs> And I talked to said neighbor the other day. He just said he doesn't want to get in the middle of it, which I can understand. <laughs> um, Mr. Chairman, I, you know, if we approve it with the concern that it has to be make the distance thing, uh, he'll be able to find that 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 solution and uh, therefore this would be moot. So I, I still stand opposed to the substitute amendment. Any other comments about the substitute amendment? Well, I guess I hope our goal is to try and find some consensus of opinion on this thing and that's, that's the reason I want to let them have two more weeks to do it. Uh, isn't the end of the world if it waits two weeks? And and uh, we've discussed the whole thing. I think we know all the parameters, but if uh, give them one more chance, and if that doesn't work, then uh, we'll have to vote it up or down. Commissioner Bender, just along those same lines. I, I mean, I'm, I've said before, I'm kind of big on dotting I's and crossing T's. And if we give him two weeks, he can come back. We can have documentation that shows exactly where it's going to be. We know exactly what we're approving. Um, you know. I, the applicant had an opportunity to address that issue before he came here today. So I think giving him two weeks to to m make sure that it's all clear, to give some more time for communication, um, makes sense to me. Any other comments? Do you want to call for a roll? Are, so we're voting on whether or not substitute. we wish to substitute the motion, not actually on the substitute motion. Uh, what? Yes, correct. Am I correct? Yep, this is the weather to adopt the uh, language of the substitute motion as your motion to ultimately vote on. Everyone understand that? Yep. I still think we need a roll call vote, please. Commissioner Bender? Yes. Kelly? Yes. Barth? No. Bennegan? Yes. Motion passes three to one. <clears throat> now we need a motion. On the substitute. On the substitute motion from the original motion of no that's before you to vote on we brought yeah. the yep oh you're right yep the substitute motions before you so a yes vote is <laughs> upholding what we just said yes to so basically that's true okay uh we'll need a roll call vote for that also bender so yes vote means to defer correct yes yes, yes. kelly yes Bart. yes Denica. yes Motion unanimously passes to defer th this appeal for two weeks. And hopefully this will, frankly, force some conversations among the parties to come to uh, an agreeable solution. Uh, I agree with you, Mr. Sorensen, there's times where uh, the communications could have avoided this, but uh, we've encouraged activity all the time with neighbors to happen before they make a written application. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. Uh, sometimes the process, as you can see today, becomes a little more complicated than you like, but it's an opportunity at least for you and the rest of the parties to get together and talk about this for two more weeks. Uh, we'll go to item 13. And I will, <coughs> excuse me, uh, reiterate again that we'll use the same process as we did on item 12. Item 13 is to consider an appeal of a decision by the Minnehaha County Planning Commission to approve conditional use permit 15-32 uh, at that property uh, site, which is approximately two and a half miles southwest of Valley Springs. David? How 
flyers. Good morning, Commissioners. David Heinel, Planning Department. Um, James and Linda Elliott. Yes. Okay. James and Linda Elliott um, and Jill and Robert Kiefer um, appealed the decision. They live just north of the property. As you mentioned, the the location for the proposed 1,200 and, or 1,250 animal unit calf CAFO operation is two and a half miles southwest of um, Valley Springs. It's right along 265th Street, straight east of um, Sioux Falls. Um, they appealed the decision to approve the conditional use permit. Um, they submitted a letter which is included for your review stating concerns um, over issues including but not limited to flies, waste, noise, environmental impact, effect on property values and guidelines for compliance, and a lot of the issues that were addressed in the, the previous Planning Commission hearing on, on May 18th, um, as well as that forward here to the map and showing um, where that property is in relation to the proposed CAFO site, which would be approximately right here. There would be um, potentially two barns. If we skip forward to the site plan here, as you can see, um, the west barn would be approximately 760 head of, of calves um, in that building. And the petitioner has stated in the narrative that this is the barn that would be built first. Um, and then the east barn would be a future barn, which they're submitting this conditional use permit request in order anticipation of their future plans. Um, and then that one would be about 400 and I think 490 head, um, bringing the total to 1,250. Um, this plan also shows the setback distances to the nearest residences, as you can see there. Um, this setback here is for um, the property to the north, as I mentioned, the appeal was submitted um, on that property owner's property. And then this one right here is the one, there's two parcels. Um, if we back up right here, pointing to these right here, there's two, there's one residence on that property. Um, and then the petitioners, they live right here. And then there's another property, a residence that, that's within the, the setback distance for a residence for this, um, this class B operation which a waiver has been obtained and is submitted for your review as well. Um, and since the, the last Planning Commission hearing, the, the petitioner submitted a landscape plan showing where the um, shelter belts would go in terms of in, in com compliance with the conditions that were approved as part of the last um, Planning Commission hearing. Um, and then they also submitted a grading plan which shows the landscape plan as well as that with the rows of trees and shrubs and, and things like that um, and then the arrows that would show the drainage that would go away from the building um, and then that's this is the west barn right there and then the east barn um, similar thing it was run away from the building as as it, as is indicated in the narrative in the staff report um, and the elevation plans um, that show the type of structure that's a, that this was that's this would be, um, as, and as was stated in the minutes, uh, it would be a typical monoslope building um, with the petitioner plans to have those manure bays at the end of the building, which you can kind of see it on there, would be right there. And then on this one, it, those are two separate buildings um, for the, the two separate ones. Um, so that all of the manure would be contained inside the building um, with the concrete walls around it. And then I think the, the narrative did mention a little bit as far as some additional storage. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> moving forward, this is that setback map again, as well as the, the aquifer mapping of showing where um, and how close this is to the shallow aquifer, which the, the petitioner submitted a geotechnical test boring log in order to determine what those water depths were um, just because of the, the nearness or clo closeness to the um, which the applicant is not required to obtain a, a state water discharge permit um, but there could be a requirement for additional test logs um, to be required just to ensure um, compliance and um, in terms of water quality and an effect on rivers and streams in the area because Four Mile Creek is right there, which goes into Split Rock and, and then the Big Sioux River. Um, and then again, this is the setback, setback map right there. 
Um, and just going through some pictures of the, the site, uh, I'll just go through these really briefly. This is where the West Barn would be, um, as it shows. Just This is looking east Can along. Can you slow down just a hair? <laughs> You're flying through this thing. Okay, so this is the existing cattle barn um, where Brendan and Selden, Selden Lacey and their property right there, looking east towards that from the, the proposed site. Um, and just moving forward here, th this is the nearest residence, Miles Lacey, which <clears throat> has submitted that waiver and was included for your review. Um, this is looking east on 265th Street towards the, the east barn and towards the left. Right over here would be that west barn right there, um, approximately where that entrance would be as, as was on the site plan. Um, and more pictures of where that west barn is looking from the east direction and then moving um, looking west back towards residences um, this is in between the the two two barns that were right there um, it's kind of a wooded area stream capacity where that drainage or flaws was indicated on the that grading plan that you saw um, and then this would be the approximate location of the proposed east barn or the future barn. Um, and the entrance right there is an existing <coughs> culvert there. Um, and moving forward, this is looking towards that, that wooded stream area that, that separates the two barns. Um, and then this is looking back west on 265th Street towards, um, towards the, the general area. Um, and then this is, again, the, the east barn looking straight on. As you can kind of see off in the distance there, um, the north residence right there, the, the property owners who submitted the appeal letter, this is where their residence is. So they're straight north of where that future east barn would be or about. Um, and then this, this one also shows there's another residence. In the other pictures to the west barn, there's no other residences you can see because there's a shelter belt that's, that's along the road there that runs um, per, or perpendicular to 265th Street. Um, and the, the, the top, topographical conditions are um, a little bit more hilly as you head to the west than you do to the east. Um, and then that residence, there's, I believe this is a farmstead off in the residence here. It's about, I think it's 40 acres, I want to say. Um, and this is looking from Four Mile Creek, standing on top of the bridge, looking up the hill towards the proposed west barn. Um, and then just looking again uh, where that Four Mile Aquifer area is. Uh, as you can see, it's pretty low. Um, and then as you go up into that, <clears throat> you get into the higher ground, um, the water tables at adequate levels. So this is at the intersection. As you can see, it, it goes up quite a bit in terms of, um, and just looking through the other pictures, you, you're looking west on 265th Street. It starts to undulate a little bit more, and there's differences in, in topography with those. Um, and, and again, there with the, the hilly nature of that. And then this is looking east on 265th Street. As I mentioned, there's that, um, that wooded, that coniferous, shelter belt that's around this property which actually goes all the way around the the quarter section property there um let's get back to the map <clears throat> so some of the things that i, I want to go through as far as the conditional use permit criteria um that all conditional use permits uh, would have to meet is one the effect upon the use and enjoyment of other property in the surrounding area for other uses already permitted and upon property values within the surrounding area the primary use of the property as you can see is surrounding the operations agricultural farmsteads in the immediate vicinity and residential acreages that surround there's approximately 10 single family dwellings that are located to the west um, as you can see right here So right here, the 10 single family dwellings are just west about over a half mile from the proposed site where the, the CAFO would be. Um, and then even beyond that, as you move forward towards the, the county highway there, which is about another a mile off to that distance, there's quite a few residential acreages. There's about 20 that are located off to the distance that are about a mile away from this proposed site. Not um, on this, not on this. Not map. on this map, but as you can see, if you back up, or, forward here 
um, you can see where that uh, the number of dwelling units starts to increase along that section, which is a popular place to live. It's around the, the Beaver Creek nature area. Um, it's a really scenic, enjoyable area, as, as the residents have mentioned, um, as well as the, the residents that live right here. There's about five to six residents, residential acreages, um, and some of those property owners may be here. They, they were they submitted concerns at the Planning Commission and were notified on May 28th of this meeting as a courtesy by the Planning Department, um, the date and time. And then you can, as you move forward here, there's a few more residences. There's a subdivision right here that it consists of about four to five lots, um, probably uh, four to five acre lots or maybe even larger than that. Um, and then moving out of that distance over here, there's some more residential acreages. And so just going through, um, there are a number of residential single family dwellings in the area. It's also a, a primarily agricultural area as mentioned um, with a previous analysis. Uh, two, that the effect upon the normal and orderly development and improvement of surrounding vacant property for uses predominant in the area. The construction of this operation will have little effect on the surrounding agricultural production lands. It, it may even be helpful to nearby agricultural production because of the manure that is produced that can be applied onto cropland as an organic fertilizer. Petitioner owns and operates enough acres of cropland, um, which uh, included in the petitioner's information were um, where, the, where those locations would be as far as where they'd be spreading the manure um, and incorporating that. Um, as a result of the operate, as a result of the, the amount produced by the operation, um, since this proposal would result in a new facility, there is potential concern by potential buyers and developers that may have an impact on future development of rural single-family acreages in the surrounding area. The comprehensive plan also, or the 1998 comprehensive development plan also repeatedly does warn against residential development inhibiting the productivity of agriculture within the county. <clears throat> and at three, that utilities, access, roads, drainage, and other necessary facilities are provided. Um, pro proposed location, as I mentioned, for the operation is a little over a half mile from County Highway 109. And the other, get the number, but as you can see where that red dot is, um, is, another, is another county highway that's a mile. So a mile on each side, there's uh, a paved surface to get to. Um, so the impact on... Um, and, I, and one thing I, I forgot to mention was that the Valley Springs Township was notified, and, and I believe he's, he told he did call me and told me that they didn't have any concerns and that they would attend this meeting. So if you have any questions for the <coughs> representative, um, they may be available to um, answer those. Petitioner intends on extending um, rural water and other utilities to the facility. Four, that the off-street parking and, and loading requirements are met. The operation is located on an approximately 20-acre site that will have enough space to meet off-street parking requirements. Parking and loading in the right-of-way will not be allowed. Five, that measures are taken to control offensive odor, fumes, dust, noise, vibration, and lighting inclusive of lighted signs so that none of these will constitute a nuisance. Since this is a proposal for a new facility, there are some possibilities for creating nuisance problems. Of the problems, CAFO operations primarily produce odor problems from animal and manure facilities, and CAFOs increase traffic and workers um, that may increase the amount of dust created on the roads. As indicated, this is a township road. Um, the submitted narrative does, include any, any, does not include any mention of an odor management plan, um, but does go through some steps that... Uh, one thing I, I forgot to mention was that an odor footprint tool was submitted by the, the petitioner, which was included in, in your packet of information that goes through the amount or those steps as far as limiting the amount of uh, nuisances as a result of the, the odor, and, and then they can go through that in, in more detail. Um, just mentioning that, that that was submitted as part of the, the Planning Commission public hearing on May 18th. Um, <clears throat> Despite low densities of single-family dwellings, certain odor control measures should be a part of this operation of this size. Um, the planting of shelter belt trees will significantly help with odor control and consideration should be given to other odor control alternatives. Although it is, it is recognized that in no case odor can be completely eliminated. Um, and that six, health, safety, general welfare of the public and the comprehensive plan 
The proposed new operation will not, unlikely cause a significant increase to the public health, safety, and, and welfare of concerns because of the low density of dwelling units in the vicinity. Um, the proposed operation will have to comply with the conditions of this permit and the regulations for CAFOs and the zoning ordinance for Minnehaha County as well as the, the ordinance require that the state law requirements from the Department of Environment and Natural Resources and the Natural Resources and Conservation Service, their standards for um, manure containment facilities and other building design. Um, these rules and regulations are designed to allow for development while preventing much of the potential harms that a CAFO facility might create. Um, the proposed CAFO expansion is located firmly within the, the commercial agricultural area of the 1998 Comprehensive Development Plan. In the description of this designated area, the Comprehensive Development Plan states that the area is intended to be preserved for farm-related uses where such activities can freely operate without the need to impose restrictions due to competing uses. And one of the policies of this designated area is to regulate concentrated animal feeding operations as the regulations that I've just went over as far as what those are in place and processing operations to help protect environmental quality and, and minimize conflicts with human activities or residential development um, in the area. <clears throat> as it is an, a commercial agricultural area, primarily being um, agricultural land. The new operation will be required to follow county ordinances concerning CAFOs and listed conditions, as I'll, I'll indicate um, in a minute. With these regulations in, in place, the proposed new operation works within the directions of the Comprehensive Development Plan. So we can just go through some of these conditions real quick as far as... Um, so the Planning Commission voted unanimously, unanimously 5 to 0 to approve CUP 1532 to allow Class B CAF CAFO. Um, so staff recommends approval of conditional use permit 1532, and these were the conditions that were approved by the, the Planning Commission and amended. The facility shall not exceed 1,250 animal units in size. Copies of the nutrient management plan shall be approved and filed with the Minnehaha County Planning Department on an annual basis. Approval must be obtained by the township for the construction of the, for the new road access <coughs> or driveway culvert permit. An address sign must be purchased at the planning department and placed at the driveway of the facility or both facilities um, because there are two. The roof sorting and receiving area must be in conformance with the South Dakota Department of Environment and Natural Resources design standards for any newly constructed waste containment facility. And a registered professional engineer shall certify the plan specifications and the construction of the facility. Six, a landscaping plan shall be submitted to the planning department consisting of shelter belt trees on the north and west sides. Any dead trees shall be replaced in, within one season. The facility shall conform to the submitted site plans. Any minor changes shall be approved by the staff at the Minnehaha County Planning Department. Major changes will require an amendment to this permit in a public hearing. All driveways, parking, and loading areas within the site must comply within the standards that are listed in section 15.04 section of the 1990 revised zoning ordinance for Minnehaha County. A, render, a rendering service must be picked up, must be used to pick up and remove dead animals from the property. 10, a building permit is required for all structures prior to construction. 11, that the Planning and Zoning Department reserves the right to enter and inspect the CAFO at any time after proper notice to the owner to ensure that the property is in full compliance with the conditional use permit conditions of approval in the Minnehaha County Zoning Ordinance. So with that, I'll entertain any questions that you have. Thank you, David. Does this, anyone have any questions currently for David? Otherwise, we'll go to the petitioner. Um, David, uh, what is the uh, setback for a CAFO of this size? So the setback of this size, since they um, is class B operation, it is the 20, is a half mile, 2640 for a residential. And all the um, um, neighbors uh, are beyond that limit. All of the neighbors are beyond that limit for the, the except for the applicant site, except this person right here, which they have submitted a waiver, and the the applicant who lives right there. Thank you. These properties are beyond. I'm sorry, you said he did sign a waiver. So this property owner Miles Lacey as you saw the the appeal letter or the waiver letter in there signed the waiver and there are two copies of that in the the actual application itself and then the petitioner lives here there's two there's one other property one house two properties and then um, the property owner that submitted the the appeal lives right here on this property which is a little over a half mile away or the 26 40 feet from the proposed facility where that location is, which would be one right here, one 
out there. Any other questions for David at this point? Just to get a sense of how many people are going to speak as proponents of this project, would you raise your hands? One, two, three, four. Okay. And those who are opponents against this project, would you raise your hand? Nobody's going to speak? Well, this might be quicker than I thought. <laughs> Lunch. <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, if the applicant or their representative, representative would like to speak, uh, please come forward, identify yourself, and give us your address. My name is Brian Donahue, and I'm an attorney here in Sioux Falls at 401 East 8th Street, 57103, Suite 215. And I represent Brenda and Selden Lacey. And just to give you a quick background and put this into context, the waivers that were discussed, uh, one is from Miles Lacey, and that's Selden's brother. And the Lacey family farming operation consists of uh, Miles Lacey and Brenda and Selden Lacey, Miles' wife, they have separate operations, but they do work together, along with their father and mother, Dick and Connie Lacey. And they have substantial agricultural production in this area, mainly hay and working with, in this case, with Brendan, or Brenda, excuse me, Brenda and, and Selden, working with these calves that they are going to raise from dairy operations. And these will be calves that they would uh, have until they get up to a certain weight, and then they would either go to a different finisher or back to the dairies. So that's what this particular Class B concentrated animal feeding operation is about. It does meet the criteria for a conditional use of this size, as was indicated by the staff. It has been recommended for approval. There were several items that were listed on the appeal by the uh, folks who live to the north of the proposed East Barn, and uh, we would be able to address each and every one of those and identify why this particular project meets all the criteria and would not cause any problems for them. At the Planning Commission meeting, we did present an odor modeling, which is a calculation based on figures that are developed through state universities that have tested concentrated animal feeding operations. We did not have a specific odor mitigation plan because that odor modeling shows that it shouldn't be a problem for anyone beyond the setbacks that are already established in your ordinance. And because this is an agricultural district and you have these setbacks, the presumption would be that there wouldn't be a problem for the health, general safety, or welfare of those people who are beyond the setbacks. In this particular instance, we could go beyond that and talk more, and we have our professional engineer, Brian Fredrickson from Dakota Environmental here, who is able to address any of those questions that might arise. But since we don't seem to have anyone here on behalf of the opponents, I'm not going to take up your time going through that unless you want to hear it. And if you'd like to hear from Brenda and Selden Lacey, they're here too, just to explain briefly their operation. But I would like to just follow this by saying, they are taking the calves that they are raising now outdoors and working with the National Resource Conservation Service to put them into a confined operation because the federal government is encouraging agricultural producers to do that because it is better for the environment. The containment of the manure, the flies, the odor, and everything here is actually a situation that improves the environment because we don't have the general uncontrolled runoff in an open lot. Where they are operating right now, they have open lots, and in order for them to go forward in the future with their children, who you have here in the audience today, their boys, they want to be able to make sure that they're here for the next generation, so they're getting out ahead of the game. They're taking advantage of some federal programs, and the NRCS is really good about helping them to make sure that this is good for the environment. And you see where we've got creeks and streams in the area, and this is going to make sure that it meets those federal regulations that they'll be able to do things right in the future. So it's a good thing for the environment, it's a good thing for agricultural production, and I'll stop talking now, and if you'd like to, I can, I can bring up the Lacy's, or we can start with the proponents, however you'd like to proceed. Uh, if the Lacy's would like to come forward and make a few comments, that would be great. I'm Brenda Lacy, my husband's Selden. Um, 
We've been raising calves for well over 16 years, and um, the dairies increase in size, and our housing, like you said, is outside housing. So when these calves are weaned, they're out, out in the open elements. And for my boys to want to stay in this, because they they work beside us all the time. I mean, they're out there with us. It's a family operation, and uh, we want to improve where the calves go so that they can grow good and the boys don't have to work as hard fighting the elements and, I mean, fixing fences. So we look to build these barns. The first barn is the barn we need the most, and the second barn is their future barn. And um, I don't know. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, I'm Selden Lacey, and I guess we have enough people backing us on this positive where I, you know, we're not doing anything wrong. You know, we're doing everything above and beyond, you know, what's really called for. So I, I guess that's really all I have to say. And like I say, we have plenty of people that are in favor of it here, so. Well, this Brenda again, they, our neighbors that live next to us, they know us. They know how we take care of the livestock. They know we will do what we can because the the environment them livestock are in shows you what kind of product you're giving back to the dairy or the other producers. If you don't take care of your livestock, that's our reputation. That's how our boys will learn to live their lives. I mean, um, I want to give them a future and I want to do our jobs right. And I know it might offend some neighbors who don't understand us, but neighbors nowadays aren't like they used to be. The People don't know each other because they might not. I mean, you can stand next to them in school, and they don't know you. But when something happens and they didn't know about it, everybody gets offended. But we all need to open our ears and listen, and that's not what this is about. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, are there any other proponents who would like to speak? I, there was a few people that raised their hands. The gentleman in the back row. Uh, Steve Ulrich, uh, 904 Eagle Run in Del Rapids, uh, currently president of the Sioux Basin Cattlemen's Association. We're affiliated with uh, the South Dakota Cattlemen's Association. Uh, we represent Minnehaha in Lincoln counties, approximately 115 members. A lot of them are here today uh, to back the Lacey's. Um, we uh, uh, got contacted uh, by a member who asked if we were coming down here. Uh, we talked to the Lacey's, uh, found out about their plan, and uh, uh, I called the board. The board unanimously voted to support the Lacey family in their plans. We feel that everything that they're doing is right, and uh, we'd like to see a family farm continue on. And uh, I guess with no opponents, I don't have to talk much longer. But I would offer uh, one thing. Uh, if the commission ever has any uh, concerns or anything about agricultural issues, to get a hold of uh, the Sioux Basin Cattlemen's uh, legally or whatever questions you might have, if we can ever help you out, uh, we really appreciate uh, uh, you know donating our services and, and helping you uh, understand any concerns you might have. So with that, I guess we support the Lacey family. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for? Uh, I believe there was a hand over here. My name is Barry Berg, and I live in 1307 North Clark Avenue in Del Rapids. And I work for the South Dakota Association of Conservation Districts, which we are a partner with NRCS, Game Fish and Park, <coughs> all the other organizations and we have the central or actually the big Sioux River watershed project and our project is also works along with NRCS that we work with producers to do conservation work in the county or in the watershed I should say and we've been working uh, with Lacey's on their their proposed plan there for the buildings and I guess I'm not going to go through everything that's been stated as far as they're following all the rules and regulations but one thing that I am concerned with is um, if the setbacks for residences around them are met, um, some of the additional criteria that 
were put on or placed on them to do um, like item number six, the shelter belt around the facilities. Um, I'm kind of concerned about the shelter belt. There should be, um, you know, some thinking done on that because these barns, the way they're designed, they're designed to breathe. Um, and in the summertime when it gets hot, even though the roof's over the top of them, you know, if the airflow isn't there, then the building doesn't operate at the best optimum capacity that it can operate. Um, if that air gets exchanged within the building and rises up, it creates its own wind inside there and it cools the building down and cools the animals down that are in the building. If you get a shelter belt that's too close to the north and the west side of the building, you might impede some of that airflow. Um, and considering where they're at, there might be a potential for some nice landscape trees like on any other um, rural residence where you not necessarily plant a shelter belt that's solid trees. You might space trees out to make it look appealing or attractive. So that's the, that's the one concern. And they're doing everything that they can possibly do, um, which costs money. Uh, these barns aren't cheap. They are, you know, they've got a concern at their place uh, that they don't necessarily need their calves outside in the elements. They could perform better in these buildings. So they're gonna build these buildings to house everything, contain everything. Um, the chances for any runoff from the building since they're concrete around are very, very minimum, if nothing at all. And so with that said, it's, it's a big expense to do these other things. Um, may be more of an expense to do shelter belt or these trees, but if done you know, in a smart manner, not necessarily a solid wall of trees to block the building from site, um, it'll allow that airflow, it'll allow the building to perform <coughs> these buildings do. Um, but that's an opinion from me, so if anybody has any questions on that. Any questions for Barry? Does it appear that way? Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Any other proponents? Mr. Bones? Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, my name is Walt Bones. My address is 46036. 268th Street at Chancellor. Even though Chancellor is a Turner County town, I am a Minnehaha County resident. And uh, just, Mr. Chairman, just a moment, if you would please, with some personal preference. Uh, or I uh, had a chance to serve on the, your planning and zoning board for 10 years, and in that position, got to work with uh, Mr. McFarland, wherever where it can go. Um, He's retired already. Yeah, he, he, he left. But I, I just wanted to. He very professional. Enjoyed working with him as a Turner County, or as a excuse me, Minnehaha County resident. I uh, wanted to thank him for his years of service, and so uh, I just want to say that. Um, I've got just three quick things that I'd like to say. Uh, number one, you folks are, are, I think, one of your next, there he is right there. Yeah. Thank you, Ken, for all your years of service. Appreciate that. <laughs> um, I think one of your next gen items is talking about your review or, and, and approval of your next comprehensive plan, your Envision plan. And, and I know how much work that goes into um, putting together one of those plans. There's there's extra chairs at all those meetings for all the residents of, of Minnehaha County if, if they want to come in and, and talk and testify and, and give public testimony in, in when, you're, when you're making this plan together. So uh, there is an opportunity for participation in the process. And uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a tedious process at times, but uh, it's something that's, that's, that has to be done. And this project complies with not only your last comprehensive plan, but it also um, satisfies all the criteria of this new plan that you've got coming on. So it does that. Um, second thing, we uh, talked a little bit about the environment. Uh, yes, they've got calves outside in open lots right now. Um, they could double, maybe even potentially triple those right now without any county action at all. Um, they want to do a better job, not only for the owners of the calves, but they also want to do a better job for the environment. And so they're going to be subjecting themselves by going through DNR, having this size of a project, uh, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, all those types of things. And they are going to subject themselves to much tighter scrutiny, um, and, and it's, but it's going to be better for the environment and better for the, for the animals. So I uh, 
applaud them in that effort. Um, this is a this is kind of an intimidating process, and even your prior applicant. Um, you know, anybody that you know, wanted to invest or to get started in agriculture, if you wanted to go buy some land or buy some cows, uh, they don't have to come before you folks. But if you want to put up a, uh, an animal, confined animal feeding operation, like, they've got to come and ask for your permission. And so these folks are, are actually raised to or are, are held to a much higher standard. And especially if they have chosen to uh, to go under the auspices of, the, of our South Dakota Department of Environment and Natural Resources. And, and thirdly, um, this epitomizes, I think, what we're looking for for family agriculture here in Minnehaha County. Uh, you got a young family, and, and again, the applicant that you had before you, just before this issue. But uh, um, this is what this is what the future of agriculture is all about. So I encourage your support of this application. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bones. Any questions for him? Mr. Chairman, I wonder, uh, Secretary Bones, you obviously have a lot of experience with all this kind of stuff. It seems like there's been an increase in, in fear in the, in the regular public about agricultural operations. I mean, uh, you know, methane that's going to blow up, uh, the, the rivers are poisoned, uh, the food is poisoned, etc. I mean, the fact is that this is a better project than cattle standing in the creek. This is a better project than, uh, you know, uh, millions of chickens standing in an open field. This is, this is, modern agriculture is making improvements, not making things worse. How can we communicate that to the public and get, uh, <laughs> sort of reduce some of that uh, fear factor? Um, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, yes, uh, Commissioner Barth, that, that's a great point. Agriculture is changing. We all carry one of these things around with us, and then as soon as the latest one comes out, we throw these away and we go get the next one. Um, agriculture is also changing, and it's changed dramatically in the last five and ten years, and it's going to change dramatically in the next five and the next ten years. Mr. Sorensen talked about communication, and, and I think that's probably the one thing where, where we have maybe, um, again, in our operations, trying to 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 adapt, become more efficient in, in all the different things we do, be it you know biotechnology, the genetically modified seeds that we use, um, be it uh, the tractors and the GPS and all those different things. I mean, we're we're just trying to, to understand it all and try to apply it to our operations, let alone communicate it to the to the general public. And 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 that's that probably falls on us in agriculture. And and we've got groups. Uh, I see Steve Dick back here from Ag United. Um, we get Steve Allrich here from the Sioux Basin Cattlemen's. Uh, we've got all of our commodity groups now that I think are, are, have, have sensed that, yeah, we are leaving the consuming public behind it. There is questions. There is concerns and, and, and legitimate. I mean, they, things are changing fast, and they need to understand that. So, um, yeah, we just need to, and, and, and I'm going to give you folks an open invitation. If, if any one of you would like to come out and, and visit our farm, um, and I know there's a number of folks here in the audience that would do exactly the same thing, we would love to have you to come out here. And if you want to ride in the combine this fall, um, <laughs> if you want to ride in the corn planter this spring, or any time come out and see the livestock operations, open invitation to each and every one of you. Um, I, we encourage that. I had six different legislators in the combine with me last fall. Um, again, just communicating uh, what we do, why we're doing it that way. And uh, so uh, hopefully I don't know if I answered your question. That's, it's a tough question to answer. But uh, again, if we just need to communicate and, and work together. Thank you, Mr. Bones. Uh, any other questions or rebuttal? Oh. I got one real quick. Um, my name is Matt Swenson. I grew up on the farm just east of the, or west, excuse me, west of the project, the closest one there. And uh, I just, for the record, I want to know everybody heard Brenda say the boys aren't going to have to work as hard. I don't think that's true. I think they're right after <laughs> a little harder. <laughs> but uh, they're a great family, and I'm for it. So that's all. Thank you, Matt. Any other comments? Yeah. yeah. My name's Don Johnson. I'm uh, on the Valley Springs Township Board, uh, and we want it to be known that Brenda and Selden got a hold of us. Uh, as far as the culvert permit and all that stuff goes, we'll handle that when they get the building ready and they need the approach, we'll do that. And I think 
I guess I'd like to see the planning and zoning outfit hand out a questionnaire before they give out a building permit for anybody building an acreage in the country. And they should visit a farm to see how it smells. If they don't like it, they should stay in town and not come out in the country where I live. <laughs> I have for 30 years and way better than the guy that walked through my yard this morning because he was black and white and not very friendly. <laughs> you know. And the deer followed him right across my front yard, but that skunk wasn't welcome. So. <laughs> but yeah, the township has no problem with it. I mean, we are an ag community out in Valley. I mean, it's mostly farm community. All the people come out and build their acreages. They like all the, the scenery and stuff, but these people still have to make a living. And that's, that's what this is about. Thank you, Don. Any other comments? Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, when people do get a building permit in our county, we do have a right to farm covenant that uh, we give them. You know, it says uh, in part, you may be subject to inconvenience or discomfort from lawful or agricultural processing and facility operations. They may include but are not limited to cultivation, harvesting and storage of crops, livestock production, ground rig or aerial application of pesticides and herbicides, the application of fertilizer, including animal waste, the operation of machinery, the application of irrigation water. Um, Discomforts may include, but are not limited to noise, odors, fumes, dust, smoke, burning, vibrations, insects, rodents, and or the operation of machinery, including aircraft. If you live near an agricultural area, you should be prepared to accept such inconveniences. Anyway, we give this out to anybody building a residence in the county, and it is a terrible conflict that we have with people that move out into the country so they uh, you know, can let their dog run loose, and then their neighbor moves in, and they let their dog run loose, and now it's spoiled for everybody, they think. Uh, we are an agricultural county, and uh, as long as I'm a commissioner, <coughs> I, I hope to keep it that way. Any other comments? If not, I would entertain a motion. Make a motion to approve... Uh, the, this CAFO item number, uh, well, it's 1532 on the uh, item 13. I'll right. second that. We have a motion and a second. Is there any other comments? Yeah. Commissioner Kelly? I, um, I find it interesting that we didn't have any opposition. But on the other hand, I think it's been a good opportunity for us to hear, particularly from Mr. Bones, the... Uh, uh, about the Fint Lacey family and what they're doing and, and the process they used. I got to compliment them for what getting everything in order coming into the meeting. And uh, uh, even had there been opposition, they, they were well prepared. I, uh, I compliment them, and, and I, I agree with Walt that it's, it's going to be that agriculture is really changing, and we've got to be on top of it here. And I think these people are trying to get ahead of the game so that they aren't caught up with a bunch of EPA rules in about five years. Thank you. Any other comments? If not, I think we do need to do a roll call vote again. Commissioner Bender? Yes. Kelly? Yes. Barth? Aye. Bender. Aye. Motion unanimously passes four to zero. Mr. Bones, if you've ever seen Commissioner Barth drive, I hope you got GPS in your combo. <laughs> Have you been talking to my wife? <laughs> uh, let's go to item 14. I think we're way past 9 o'clock. Thank you um, very much. Thank you. Consider adoption of the Minnehaha County Envision 2035 Comprehensive Plan. David. I'm going to introduce David and Kevin um, while he gets the presentation up and running. Let's Scott Anderson. Just wait a second so people can leave and we can okay. hear you. What if we introduced the comprehensive plan and no one came? <laughs> Anyone in the audience would like one of these? Uh, these <laughs> Good opportunity. Ken? Ken? Yes. Uh, got a couple batteries. Oh, yeah. 
We probably need to move them down the hall. <coughs> okay, if we could uh, go back to item 14, uh, David and Scott. Once again, Scott Anderson, County Planning Department. And you may recall that uh, we, about three years ago or so, we started on a process of adopting, uh, revising and adopting a new comprehensive plan. Uh, there was a task force that was set up and we have had uh, many meetings uh, since then, both with our task force and with uh, public hearings and public open houses. We were at the fair a, a couple of years ago for the entire two weekends and full week there, uh, soliciting comments and, and input from the public. And we had hundreds of people talk to us at that time just at the fair. We've had public open houses in Brandon and Hartford and Humboldt and, and Del Rapids. So we have been um, really getting the word out. Uh, we, we've also had a website. So with that, I will introduce uh, and thank also Kevin uh, Hookman and David Heinold for all the work that they've done putting this together and, and uh, <coughs> shepherding it to a final completion process. And today is a public hearing on the adoption of our, our new um, comprehensive plan, which is called Envision 2035. And with that, I will let uh, Kevin and David uh, give you an overview of the plan. Thanks, Scott. Well, Kevin brings that up. I'll just go through a few things. Um, as Scott mentioned, um, the purpose of the Envision 2035 comprehensive plan is to set the goals and priorities recommended by a multitude of stakeholders that, um, in addition to um, those who those who you have chosen as the task force members, advisory board members, consistent of department heads across the, the spectrum, um, and other individuals, in, including um, staff in terms of the Planning Commission and the County Commission, the time that you've put into this, um, has been recognized throughout the plan as well as uh, members of the general public. Um, and this plan will help, as the last plan is, has done, is help provide direction in making land use decisions, uh, land use and development decisions in the rural area. Um, it will help communicate the values of what um, future, current and future generations want to see um, in terms of those goals and policies is reflected into the future. Um, and just moving forward here. Um, this is just kind of an outline of everything as we've already gone through the welcome introductions. Um, we'll just go through briefly the planning process and, and how we got to this point and discuss some of the chapters in, in a little bit of detail and, and have some questions at the end for comments or public input if there, if there is any. Um, just skipping forward and going through um, this process, uh, planning gives you choices, you know, um, planning for the future on how you want to live and, and what what kind of land uses that you want to have um, nearby your house and, and, and giving you opportunities to have a say in, in the matter of um, where you want to live and how you want to live and, and how you want to go about your, your lifestyles. Um, it includes things like parks and open space, agriculture, not to mention a few residential, um, tra managing transportation impacts to the system with um, the amount of development that and growth management growth is occurring. Um, and then and another big thing is environmental stewardship, on the other hand, is, is managing those conservation areas and protecting those for future generations and having those resources be available because of the abundance of natural resources in, in the county. Um, let's get forward here and just going through the, the process. In, um, as you know, the process was started in 2012 or late 2011 with the, um, the recommendation for the members on the task force committee. Um, really, planning represents a continuous process that we have to continually evolve to meet other changes in the environment in, in the area around you, especially when um, municipalities are experiencing growth. Um, is, is the counties have, have to manage that growth in, in a responsible manner that helps protect the things that people want to see. Um, as I've mentioned, that planning gives you choices on, on, on how and where you want to live in accordance with the regulations. Um, and then again, it, prevent, or it presents an opportunity for individual opportunities to be engaged in the comprehensive planning process to help contribute ideas for the future. Um, just going through here. Um, First step in the process is obviously in 2012 or 
2010-2012, this plan review and update process is, is gathering the members that would be on that task force, that committee that would help develop that plan, um, informing that structure um, and recruiting people to be on that plan to help gather new ideas and, and concerns for the future. And, and then the next step would obviously be developing a schedule for meetings. Um, and then during that process between the, the plan review and update process and the draft plan, there's an opportunity for public comment and in, in, in incorporating certain policies into that. This kind of skips forward a little bit. Um, the next slide will go into that public input section. Um, holding additional meetings for, for people to have an opportunity to express their ideas and concerns for the future and what's included in, in the draft plan. And then this is uh, more on the, the public and stakeholder input of the task force, advisory board, planning commission, county commission, et cetera, um, and gathering and brainstorming new ideas and, and having those workshops and open houses available in, in all areas of the county. Um, there were a total of six to seven open houses that were out there, as you know, um, spread out throughout the county to help spread the reach um, to all areas <coughs> to solicit public input. Um, and then, of course, there's the commission review. The planning commission has already reviewed this and is, is recommending adoption of the plan is on this final draft as an, in an advertised public hearing um, and then presenting to, to this body, the county commission, in an advertised public hearing as well. Um, and then really the next step beyond this is the planning adoption implementation process, which takes effect upon approved resolution by the county commission, as you know, beginning research on implementation methods of things that are included within the plan for goals and policies in that, that very plan and, and continuously, continuously allowing for public input and new ideas um, about what's in the, the document throughout the entire period, that 20 years as it goes out to that 2035 um, <clears throat> Process. So the plan elements, I'll let Kevin go through. Uh, so uh, as you mentioned, we had lots of public input throughout this process. Uh, and these are the plan elements that have kind of evolved out of the public input. Uh, the, is the chapter, so to speak. Um, and the strengths and challenges that are provided in the plan elements, this page here, uh, are brought to us by uh, comments that were written on uh, comment cards or provided us uh, verbally through uh, the public open houses. And, and I would just like to point out some of the strengths. And the, and the challenges, uh, in a sense, are the uh, how we progress through those strengths is, kind of, is how the challenges kind of lay out uh, and what we need to do to strengthen our, those um, areas. Uh, but some of our strengths in the economic development, we have an agricultural economy, uh, fair tax climate and entrepreneurial atmosphere. And rural ha character uh, strengths include the density of the ca the area and the preserved farmland, a good balance of differing land uses. Uh, the land and water resources, we have lots of available natural resources, including uh, stone and water and uh, gravel. Uh, we have strong rural quality of life and well-defined drainage through most of the county. Uh, transportation, uh, we are advantaged by being part of a major crossroads of two interstate intersections. Um, we are, have convenience access to railroads, and we are in good proximity to Sioux Falls as a regional uh, center for employment and commerce. Uh, for future land use, some of our strengths uh, is to projecting the prime farmland. Uh, uh, the agricultural economy will, in the future, preserve from, because of that prime farmland. Um, the existing uh, rural service areas um, are already there and, and have lots of amenities for the rural residents. Park amenities, amenities and school facilities are also available uh, in very good quantities within the, uh, the county. And then intergovernmental cooperation. Uh, we have worked very well with joint planning municipalities and effective dialogue with state, federal, and other entities, as well as uh, updating the services such as roads and, and other services uh, as needed. So those are the, the plan elements that have really stuck out as strengths for us. So in skipping forward to um, one of the sections on population and employment analysis, um, 
and, and just point to the chart right here, the total population chart is developed on a, a number of different ranges as far as projected population growth, which could anywhere be total population between like 206,000 and 236,000 with pretty much everything remaining the same as far as growth rates. Um, not too much to, to delve into that because population changes can can shift and, and, other, and other demographics can be taken into effect as far as the growth of certain municipalities in other areas. Um, but in helping to plan for certain shifts like that, it's, it's helpful to know what those projected ranges would be because it helps manage the amount of residences in those areas that are more appropriate for residential development, uh, as will be discussed with the future land use plan. Um, and then it, it's also helpful for regional highway and air transportation systems um, is managing the transportation system in a manner that which actually goes along between the transportation and land use correlation between each other as far as um, controlling development to a point where you don't have to have those costly upgrades to um, systems, transportation systems in general, um, and other systems um, like water and sewer and other things like that. Um, and other things, uh, the, the diagram below, as you can see right here, the so commuter statistics inflow outflow diagram of people coming into the county versus going out. Um, as you can see, there's, and this is based off the census, ultimately the Census Bureau's, their, their data um, on the amount of people that are employed outside the county, but or driving inside the county and primarily most of that of course would be Sioux Falls and other municipalities but there are areas in the county that um, that could be true because unless you go through and, and, and specifically go line by line through um, where everybody lives and where they're working you know they don't they're not just working within municipalities they're working in other areas too um, so that's it's kind of what that uh, and, and less people less than half of the people that are coming in are going out live here but in work in other places um, and then the other way around it's it's more of a total for the amount of people living and working here as you can see the arrow that goes around in a circle um, this next section the existing land use analysis I'll let Kevin touch on that Again, I'll just touch on this as briefly as I can. Um, and the existing land, this chart that we have in front in the, the PowerPoint uh, is a chart that has the highlighted areas of residential, agricultural, non-residential, so on. Um, and these areas uh, are subdivided further in the actual plan. Uh, but you can see in this this abbreviated chart that uh, we're still a vast majority agricultural land in Manihaw County, despite uh, having lots of um, urban areas as well. Uh, if you see that it, there are 11 incorporated cities that ha include about 11 percent um, of the total land area of the county. But then the agricultural uh, takes up the vast majority of the remainder at 79% uh, uh, of the uh, county. So then the rest, uh, the residential lots, for example, there are lots of them. There's almost as many residential lots as there's agricultural land. Uh, however, it really does not take up very much land in, in quantity for land actual size. So just point that out. And going forward to one of the sections on growth management, which, as we know, is a, a pretty hot-button issue. Um, but, of course, as Kevin just mentioned, there's more than enough agricultural land in what we consider is, is an agriculturally dominant economy. Um, and I just want to point out one thing that, you know, that that may be coming, coming through in the future is helping to, especially on the topic of growth management and a call that I received as far as the, one of the proposed industrial centers, um, the expansions of a municipality, that brings new, new challenges to present to a plan that's in, in the process of adoption and uh, in trying to go back and review those things on, on how, how does that work within the, the proposed comprehensive plan and um, so that's what kind of wanted to mention on that. Um, so how does it fit? Um, and then another thing that, that came up through the process was helping determine um, ideas to help support the local agricultural community. And that may be something through like a community local food study, which identifying um, opportunities for agricultural operators for 
code revisions to help simplify the permitting process, as was mentioned before, by the um, but just the general public um, for those local entrepreneurial ag operators. Um, and then the other one is uh, is working the agricultural tourism side is working with the state tourism department to help promote what we have and to promote local agricultural grown products to people out of state and in state to help reduce impacts on the transportation system and and continuing <coughs> on that um, another thing that was mentioned by the or two of the things that were brought up by the task force and, and several other in the public input process was revising those building eligibility transfer standards moving away from the one per 40 acre building eligibility and looking at transferring those to areas that are near transition areas where the services are more provided. Um, and Kevin can touch on that with the rural conservation section because that falls under the housing density section uh, in more detail. Uh, but identifying what those are and it doesn't necessarily, it's a, it's included as an action or a goal in a, or action step, I believe in, in the, uh, housing density section and the other one was the reverse setback standards for dwellings from CAFOs right now we have the, the setback distance for a new or from CAFOs for dwellings or, sorry for for CAFOs from dwellings um, just two words mixed up but I, having that be a reverse setback standard um, so that like Kevin talk about the rural conservation all right so as part of this chapter, this uh, planned element, uh, we looked at these four subcategories, the historic preservation, uh, uh, both very openly historic items such as uh, Zawal Lake or openly uh, internal items um, uh, in parks, uh, but also less public items such as the, the barns and the houses and, and trying to look at ways that we can uh, adapt those for the future use. Uh, and, and we've kind of started that in some of our um, ordinance now, but we're gonna look into that more in the future as our plan leads us. Uh, the natural character, uh, we have good natural character um, with lots of wetlands. Uh, the park system we have, Booker Prairie, shows natural prairie land um, as it grows through the years. Uh, then farming and community, that's a major, thing to conserve and promote in the future. And then housing density, I'll touch on a little bit more with this map. Uh, currently, housing density has one house per 40 acres. Uh, and you can see that uh, the density is growing quite faster as you get closer to Sioux Falls. Um, and if we're going to be preserving uh, agricultural areas, uh, one house per 40 acres may still be pretty dense, uh, having other non-agricultural people living in, the, say, uh, some of these green spaces with fewer residences uh, can really cause lots of troubles as a regular operation of agriculture. So um, the plan kind of points out to a direction of these transfer of development rights where you transfer the building eligibility from an agricultural area to an area that is better suited for it. Uh, that has amenities that can be uh, regulated and uh, in a different fashion than the agricultural setting. Um, and these areas can be uh, identified as as like wall lake area or maybe even renter and they're identified in the rural service areas in the um, uh, the comp plan later on so Moving forward to the environmental stewardship section, um, touch briefly on this. As far as I indicated, the, the demand on natural resources supply on, on what we have available to us in terms of mining operations and, and things like that, um, as well as the agricultural community, um, and the impact that certain uses have on wildlife habitat management in terms of um, stormwater management, which is um, an issue that the Environmental Protection Agency identified as the county meeting their standards for a municipal separate storm sewer system um, and controlling stormwater in, in subdivisions and areas primarily lying around the city of Sioux Falls and in the, in the Brandon area. Um, 
is addressing those issues and, and having a stormwater management plan to address certain things like illicit discharges and pollution prevention um, and promoting best management practices like you, as you can see with the the image there is kind of a snapshot of some of those practices that are used like filter strips and, and to help control the amount of pollutants that are entering waterways and other um, types of issues like that um, by 2019 and, and along with that becomes a, a public education and outreach campaign that can involve more even more participation and involvement among the residents in those areas um, and then uh, as well as the, the county state parks which could be opportunities to, to take the lead on implementing best management practices uh, in areas where there's more population and more potential for um, other issues to come from all different kinds of land uses uh, in, in the issues that are resolved from those. <coughs> and again, with the conservation, federal lands is, is a similar type thing, but at a different level. It's not at the, the county. In um, the transportation section, um, so one of the things that I, I wanted to point out and that's in the plan um, is the significance of freight transportation on the regional and national system. Um, I dissolved a few things from the 2010 state rail plan from the Department of Transportation. Um, the volumes by weight category, their, their projections of 2040, rail shows a demand of 84%. On the other hand, there's a, a, a trucking demand, a change, and this is by volumes by weight is what I pulled out there. 91% within the state, 201% from the state, and 125% to the state, to here, um, and that's spread out through the entire state of South Dakota. So there's obviously some some areas that are a little bit more popular, um, but being along the major interstates of I-29 and, and 90, um, are, are those issues that be addressed? Um, projected population growth, access management. Um, and road and bridge maintenance goes along with that and being involved throughout the regional transportation planning process, which is continually being done, um, uh, as well as certain corridor projects that would be addressed in the future land use plan in more detail in areas that are mainly near Sioux Falls and um, routes to Del Rapids, Hartford, and Brandon, the areas that are experiencing more growth. Um, and then the last one, which the Governor Dennis Dugard set a standard um, and signed into law the um, minimum six foot passing distance for motorists overtaking a bicyclist to share the road um, campaign. And, and that's something that the Department of Transportation is working through to identify what, um, how that works and, and what that entails. Um, so that just goes along with the recognizing importance of the regional and national nationwide movement to identify connections to municipal trails and routes with multi-use pathways and existing or wide shoulders that are in municipalities um, and connecting uh, communities. Mr. Chairman, just uh, David, isn't it uh, six feet if you're at over 40 miles an hour and then three feet if it's like 25 miles six an hour? Six feet over 35 miles an hour. Oh, over 35, speed. thanks. <clears throat> uh, Let's get forward to the map. This is just the, it shows the transportation system. Um, and this is from the, the Department of Transportation's information as far as the functional classifications of the roadways. So you have your arterials, collectors, um, local roadways, primarily in the township road system. Um, so we won't go into too much detail on that because that it's as is. Um, and there's a little bit of differences between um, some of the data that is newer. Um, so that, and just going into some more detail on the non-motorized transportation recreation map um, and identifying some of those that have been through the process. Um, you have your existing routes, the 115, which has adequate shoulders. It's eight foot wide. And then the other one that you're probably more familiar with is the one up to one from Brandon to Garrettson that is a signed route. Um, and other things that in, in talking with the county highway department is the potential for four foot wide shoulders, which is an adequate amount of space for the comfortability of um, non-motorized transportation recreation users um, and identifying this route as a, a proposed alternative, something that would happen um, probably 10, 15 years down the road, but that's not nothing that um, anything that is in the near future or down the line. Um, 
So this is right here, the green line, as you can see there, and then the other lines that were dissolved throughout the, the process by public citizens and people that have contributed ideas to the planning process are connecting communities to um, kind of a system that people can, can get out and enjoy being in the rural area at the same time, enjoy our county parks, um, Booker Prairie and, and Wall Lake Park. Um, so that's... I'll touch on that, and if you have any questions, I'll, I'll be glad to answer them. And uh, let Kevin talk about the future land use plan. All right, so the future land use plan was divided into four subcategories, and I'll just move on to the map since that will really help us kind of define the areas. Um, on the map here, the agricultural uh, area is defined as anywhere that's not... Um, designated for something else um, the and, and that has been traditional with the other plan as well uh, so the agricultural a growth area would be there to support existing ag and to support uh, future growth in agricultural areas uh, be it um, uh, more uh, intense agriculture or um, uh, the drainage and all that sort of things is, is something to keep and maintain in this area. The transition area, which would be this yellowish with the dotted line color around, and even as around smaller communities and non-communities like Lyons and Wall Lake. And the transition area is areas where um, this agricultural uh, large agricultural production may not be appropriate um, use uh, for long-term future use um, because of the the fast approaching use uh, residential uses and uh, commercial type uses of the cities and um, the growth of the cities um, also uh, it would be a good area to say uh, around Wall Lake where they already have existing facilities such as sanitary <coughs> soil uh, to allow for uh, managed growth in those types of areas. And then we have the rural service areas uh, that are in these squares uh, by size. Uh, the size of the square, if, say a quarter mile would be the, the square would be about the size of or the um, aerial extent of the, the proposed uh, what we feel would be appropriate for those locations. Um, and this is partly why they're so big is because uh, businesses in the county end up being large <coughs> land um, consuming businesses. You have truck pla places, you have uh, seed places and that sort of thing that take up a lot of space. So um, uh, if you say we have a half a mile wide area, uh, we're not going to pack in one business every uh, acre so um, it, it may look really big but uh, we feel like this would be good for growth in the future and a lot of these uh, rural service areas are traditional rural service areas that were, have been there from e existing towns or perhaps like Lyons. It's along the railroad, so it's uh, easy access to the railroad, and there's a community there. Um, so it really suits to um, existing and future growth of the transition or the rural service area. And then the final areas would be these corridor studies. And this would be for uh, kind of a future view of things. Um, we had lots of success with the Red Rock Corridor study and uh, forming uh, a corridor that would be uh, uh, in the long-term future uh, prevent um, the strip-style development that goes along highways or uh, over use of say billboards uh, where now off premise signs are not allowed in the Red Rock Corridor because they didn't want them there and each one of these areas that are designated for corridor plans would uh, entail uh, basically the whole planning process from uh, getting people together to have a task force of looking at people, looking at uh, meeting with the residents in the area, the landowners, to see how they want to plan those in a more specific manner rather than, say, a dot on, on the highway. We can plan that to say, okay, this side is going to be industrial, this side is more commercial favored, um, that sort of more detailed planning of those corridors. So that concludes the presentation as far as um, the impact and we just want to remind people that 
we want your input on this plan. It, it, it really does help develop a vision for the future of Minnehaha County. Um, and it gives us the opportunity to, it gives you the opportunity to make your voice heard to help, um, to help manage certain land uses that you may not want next year um, to house in, in terms of rearrange those things and in, in terms of what standards are what we put forward through um, certain development standards for, for commercial development um, and what people want to see. So um, just with that, I'd like to thank you for your or thank you for your support and thank you for um, being involved in the process and, and we hope to continue this in the future. Thank you. thank you, David, and thank you, Kevin. I know it's a lot of work, and Bonnie Duffy's here. She was part of the planning process uh, on that committee and f dedicated a ton of hours to making that happen, so thank you for that support also. Anyone have any questions for David or Kevin? If not, uh, is there a motion to adopt Compliance. the comprehensive plan or do we not have to do that today we, do. we do need the resolution yeah, i'll make that motion thank you second a motion and a second to adopt the comprehensive plan for envision 230 2035 all those in favor say aye aye, aye. opposed motion unanimously passes item 15 is in reference to any county commission liaison reports do we have any liaison reports Mis mr chair i'm not uh, reporting on the Planning Commission, but I wonder, since they're here, uh, about the annexations uh, to include this new industrial zone that the city is planning on uh, developing in the county. Scott, uh, do you have any uh, any information on when that might happen? Uh, I was talking to this gentleman. Uh, what was the question again? The, the question is, uh, this new uh, industrial development that the city has announced, uh, which is actually located within the county up by Macrossens, yes. uh, what's the status of that? When will we start seeing that annexation request? And are, is it contiguous with the city? It is, at this point, not contiguous with the city. They'll, they'll have to do some kind of annexation process, and that may include, I think there are several avenues that they can approach to make that contiguous. Uh, they could sort of come from the south, from the uh, southeast, and go north, west. They could go straight north, and would have to include somehow, maybe be working with Macrossens Boys Ranch to include that property in their annexation request. Um, so I have not been privy to their annexation schedule. They have not let. They have not informed me on when they will be bringing forth an annexation request. I have made sure that the city is now including the commission office and several, you know, the members of the of the county commission in their, um, when they submit their annexation petition requests, you are now getting that information as well as the county commission office. Other than that, um, it appears that it'll be annexed into the city and uh, they will be providing uh, city services to that property such as water and sewer thank you thank you any other liaison reports here, here comes the old guy commissioners along those things as long as you're on that topic um, <coughs> we've made some specific requests from the city to let us know even when these voluntary annexations are happening so that we could help monitor that our office has not yet seen the one for uh, the northwest part of town, but we did receive on Friday and through a glitch in Dropbox, and we just wanted, to, and it's our intent to put these under notices and requests when we get them, and, then, and we didn't get this one until late, but this is a voluntary annexation request that we've been notified of for 40 acre parcel just north of Cactus Heights, or uh, yeah. Cactus Heights, which is in the northeast part of the city. And this one is, in fact, contiguous. I mean, it's next to the city boundaries. So, again, it's our intent as we get these um, notices from the city just for to try to keep you informed, because we will list these under notices and request as we get them just for informational purposes. Thank you, Ken. Uh, is there any new business? Any old business? Uh, you'll notice you got a copy of the Chamber Advocate in front of you. Um, 
I asked Robert to make copies. If, I'm sure some of you have seen it, maybe some not, but uh, <coughs> the city has kind of included us in their legislative priorities now, and I, uh, uh, I think they recognize our problem, and we've got some support on the city council. And I think working forward on this thing, uh, this will be a very good deal for, for all involved. But the recognition by the city of the county's issues uh, and maybe going in combined sometimes on, on legislative issues will be a big deal. And so I just want to make sure everybody had a chance to read that because I thought it was a rather significant view of the last few years. Okay, thank you. Any other business? If not, can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Those so in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, consider by yourself. <laughs> <laughs>